had some business we had to take care of uh, prior to coming out here tonight. So uh, I'm going to call to order the August 12, 2019 Royal Oak City Commission meeting to order. We're going to begin with an invocation given by Commissioner Macy, uh, followed by the Pledge of Allegiance. So if you can stand, please do so. It was a beautiful weekend in Royal Oak this weekend. We had some out-of-town guests come to stay, and Royal Oak was showing off. We went, walked through the leafy neighborhoods to the parks. We went to the zoo. We went to the downtown. I was so proud to see our city through someone else's eyes and see with new eyes what a great place it is that we live. When we sit down here at this table, a lot of times we talk about the problems, the issues, the compromises, things that could go wrong or have gone wrong in this city. And it was a nice, refreshing change of pace to think about all the things that have gone right to get us to where we are in this great city. So for just one moment before we sit down today, I'd like to remember for us all to be grateful for what a beautiful city we live in and all the hard work that so many years of citizens have done to get to where we are today. Amen. Amen. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. All right, this brings us to item number four on the agenda, which is the presentation of a donation to the Royal Oak Animal Shelter. I'll ask that... Uh, Ms. Rapinski, Ms. Rivard, and Mr. Moore, come up to the podium if you can. Oh. <laughs> From time to time, we like to do t-shirt fundraisers to show off our cool uh, Royal Oak brand and to give people an opportunity to show their pride. And we recently did a t-shirt fundraiser that says proud and used the RO, incorporated the RO logo in it. And we're really happy to say that we raised $1,070 for the Royal Oak Animal Shelter. Well, yeah. Absolutely. Okay, we, we have uh, Dawn Rapinski, and she's going to talk about the dog walk, and I thank you, the City of Royal Oak, for the money. It's well needed. Thank Absolutely. you. Absolutely. So I'm going to segue into, very quickly, a dog walk fundraiser that will actually be, it will be the day of the of Oktoberfest on sat Saturday, September 14th. So this is your first invitation, so bring your dog. Everybody? And I'm going to pass these out to the commissioners. Make sure they got one. Yeah. Oh, do you want to yeah. Yeah. Very good. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. This brings us to item number five, which is the presentation of the Police Department Citizen Award. Maybe down there back. I will. Amanda Wade. Um, Mayor, City Commission, uh, on June 3rd, 2019, a third grader from Oak Ridge Elementary had left the school grounds without anybody on campus realizing this, realizing it prior to the 3.30 bell. Uh, when his parents arrived to pick this, uh, the child up from school, the boy was nowhere to be found. The Royal Oak Police Department responded just after 4 o'clock, and we had the entire shift out looking for this missing child. Resident Amanda Wade uh, from the 2400 block of Guthrie, over three and a half miles away, located a boy matching the description and spoke to him near her home as he was walking southbound on Stevenson and 10 Mile. Uh, Miss Wade followed the boy and tried to get him to stop and speak to her further, but the boy started running towards Campbell. Uh, this is at the height of rush hour traffic. Ms. Wade uh, notified the Royal Oak Police Department and kept the dispatch aware of the young, uh, young boy's location and conditions. And um, we were able to uh, find the boy just after 5 o'clock 
and uh, reunite this young man with his mother very safely. And we just want to commend Miss Wade uh, for her willingness to get involved and her persistence. Uh, this could have been a very tragic outcome as this, this boy was running around in an unfamiliar neighborhood. And um, we very much appreciate it, and we're very honored to give you our Citizen Award. Thank you. Woo! Thank you, Ms. Wade, for your efforts. As a father of three, I can't imagine my child running loose. And, uh, you know, it's, I'm glad we have such concerned and um, citizens in the community, and we're so grateful that you were looking out for one of our own. Thank you. This brings us to item number six tonight, which is public comment. So before we begin public comment, establish a few ground rules. Um, the City Commission values and relies on the input of our fellow citizens to help us make decisions. Now is the time set aside for the public to address the City Commission on any related issue, whether or not it's on the agenda tonight or not. Um, this will be the only time for the public to address the Commission. Uh, and I ask that comments be directed to the commission as a whole and not to individual commissioners. If you wish to speak tonight, raise your hand, um, and uh, I'll call on you. Come to the podium, state your name and address for the record, and please be mindful that the city commission does want to hear from anyone who wishes to speak tonight, so comments are limited to three minutes or less, and we have a timer at the podium to help you keep track of your time. If you don't wish to speak tonight, that's all right. Feel free at any time to reach out to any one of the commissioners or our uh, city manager or any staff uh, with your concerns or questions. Um, and please know the city commission won't respond directly uh, to questions during public comment. However, we are taking notes, uh, and our city manager is also taking notes, and we will discuss your questions uh, when the topic is discussed. And if your questions or concerns don't relate to any agenda topic tonight, uh, we'll follow up. So uh, with that, who's first? Uh, we'll go with the hand right here. Yes, sir. Evening. Uh, my name is uh, Patrick McGee, 4524 Elmhurst Avenue. Um, I'm going to be brief, uh, so I don't take up too much time. I want... Can you guys hear me? I can hear you. We can hear you, but they can't. I'm okay with that. Addressing <laughs> <laughs> them. Um, I'd like to thank you guys for responding to my uh, email about my sidewalk replacement. It was uh, very nice of you guys to take the time and diligence to respond dr back to me and the response I got back from the City of Engineering office. So I appreciate the individuals of the City, Com uh, city Council that got back to me. Um, appreciate it. Thank you. Um, and then just real be brief. The, on the consent agenda, item I, the um, Delmere Road closure, the um, that neighborhood has already had a lot of construction. And I'm kind of curious if this construction has anything to do with the um, H2O, um, H2S smells that were occurring back in 2017 that the city was notified about through both the paper. I sent an email to Matt, uh, the city engineer, about this smell that was coming up through the sewers in that area. Um, the J, these are items I'd like you to pull off the consent agenda, if possible. Item J, um, I don't like the sidewalk program in any fashion. That's just my opinion. Um, and um, for the tree planting that's going on in that neighborhood, I didn't receive any notification from the city that a tree would be planted on my, my property. So I don't know how the selection was done because I could use a tree if my house was overlooked or not. So I'm kind of curious on what their selection was. If you guys could pull item M. So I, I J, and M, I'd love to see a discussion about if you guys have the time and energy. And um, lastly, for the marijuana discussion, I'm, I'd be for it. So thank you. All right. Thank you, Mr. McGee. Uh, we'll go right in the back. Hello. My name is Michelle Spicer. I live at 623 East 6th Street in downtown Royal Oak. Um, I'm here to comment about the uh, condo project on Washington and Hudson. Uh, I am in support of that. I 
am considering selling my home. It's a little bit too big for me. Um, I think this project is a great idea. Uh, there are very few options in downtown Royal Oak that are for small condos that are affordable. Um, so that's all I'm here to do. Just to let you know, I think it's a great idea. We need some more affordable places in downtown. Thank you, Ms. Spicer. Thanks. Mr. Ashley. Good evening. My name is Alan Ashley, president of Royal Oak Manor. Uh, this is only maybe the second time I've done this. I would like to thank the Royal Oak Police Department. Last month, uh, we had two large uh, heating boilers put in to our building through the roof, and we had to clear out 21 spaces of parking lots in our main parking lot. The city of uh, the Royal Oak Police Department bagged all the parking spaces around Royal Oak and let those 21 people park there so they could have the crane come in and lower in two giant boilers, which only took a day, which is surprising. Uh, but thank you again to the Royal Oak Police Department for let us, let us use those parking spaces for one day. The other comment I have is the noise from 526. Last Thursday, it was, I live on the east side of Royal Oak Manor, which is on Williams. I could hear and follow along with the music like if I was at Pine Knob listening to Black Sabbath on top of the hill. <laughs> on the other side, it would be like listening to Metallica on the first row. <laughs> now, some of you people don't know what Pine Knob is. Pine Knob is now DTE Theater. But if you've ever been into 526 when they have their music going, if you have a drink on the table, the drink ripples from the vibrations of the band. That band place is so small and the decibels are so loud, it was unbelievable. Now they played until about 12.30 on Thursday. Normally they play until 1, 1 1.30 on the weekends. And for seniors living across the street from them, it's like being at Pine Knob. I mean, it's ridiculous, and we have several calls. We've even had one person go over there and then ask the people to turn it down. He says, we don't care about just the one percenters, and they walked away. But it is so loud on the weekends. Now, they were very quiet this weekend. I've had 13 people come up to me as president and tell me how loud it is, and I tell them to file a complaint with the police. They said they did. Uh, this weekend was quiet, but I suspect between now and when the winter sets in, those casement windows will be open again, and I will be listening at the top of the hill <coughs> for some blues, which I don't mind, but at 1.30 in the morning, I do mind. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Ashton. All right, who's next this evening? Yes, sir. Hello, my name is Jim Hammond. I live at 3415 Benjamin, and it's up by 13 Mile. And uh, I just wanted to say that uh, I do ride my bike a lot in the city, and a lot of the bike paths that uh, you've established are very helpful. Uh, we uh, just recently crossed Normandy, which has sharrows on it. The sharrows are getting very worn. It's very hard to see them. And uh, when you get over to Main Street, you have the nice bike path that takes you all the way down to you. you get into downtown. And then you follow the bike path around, and we, you work our way all the way to 5th Street over to Grant Park. And I hadn't been to Grant Park in a while, but when we got there, we saw the workout facility that you've installed there. Really impressed with it. It's very uh, functional. It uh, gives you a good, you have the capability of getting a good workout. And I really hope that you can incorporate something uh, to that effect in Normandy when that is developed. So it's just a thought, and um, I appreciate what you've done. So just keep up the good work. Thank, Thank you, you, Mr. Hammond. Yes, sir. Hello. My name is Mike Elias. I'm, I'm not a resident. Um, I'm the CEO of Common Citizen, a vertically integrated cannabis operation in the state of Michigan. Um, we got about a 1.2 million square foot um, hybrid greenhouse in Marshall, uh, 200,000 square feet just got erected in about 10 retail channels. Before I got into cannabis, I ran a hospital, uh, 450 bed quaternary facility, spent 21 years in healthcare, 
uh, started at the St. John Health System as a master black belt and uh, eventually ran a pretty large, sizable hospital uh, in Toronto, Canada. Yeah, I grew up in Southeast Michigan. Um, so my point is we are bringing class and sophistication to an industry that sorely needs it. Uh, I just wrote an op-ed that got published by the Detroit News uh, a couple weeks ago on the need for safety standards and specifically GMP standards. The state is not regulating operators like us to follow food and drug and safety precautions that, they, uh, that the FDA has put in place. Huge risk um, because the people at the end of the supply chain are already immunocompromised and we're further compounding the issue by, by not being proactive in terms of how we, how we mass produce a product that's never been mass produced on this scale. My, my uh, Flint just got open, uh, it's called Common Citizen, and you'll see that we are raising the bar on how this industry <coughs> comes into fruition. It took uh, four interviews to land our citizen advisors, we don't call them bud tenders, um, just changing the game on, on bringing more education, hand-holding, typical interaction in our stores about 45 minutes to an hour. Um, new people who have no idea what these terms mean like um, OG Kush and Pug's Breath and all these terms that are essentially basement terms. We are changing the game on that. We are highly interested in being in Royal Oak. And the other thing I want to mention is the, 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 the industry is so sensitive. Um, there's not a lot of room for error. And um, cities that are throwing it to the wind through a lotto just is not setting us up for success in any way. We are big fans of a very stringent merit-based system. Um, and I think that is sort of what I wanted to say is that we are in favor of that. Obviously, the citizens uh, and you are going to make that decision, and we respect it. Uh, but we're looking at um, coming in and doing the same thing here. So commoncitizen.com, you get a sense of what that is. Um, a lot of PR on Michigan Pure Med, which is our holding company, and uh, we're happy to be a resource um, if, if need be. Thank you so much. Thank you, Mr. Elias. Yes, sir. Uh, good evening, commissioners. My name is James Campbell. I'm a business owner at 300 East 4th Street. I'm a Michigan licensed certified public accountant and I'm domiciled my business in Royal Oak for the past 10 years. In fact, I'd like to let you know that September 9th will be my 10 year anniversary in the city. My professional practice is in uh, marijuana and I'm one of the top industry experts in the state. I've worked with many clients to assist with MMFLA licensing throughout the state. This is the very first time I'm addressing marijuana business issues in my backyard. This has forced me to reflect hard on what do I want cannabis businesses to look like my community. There's no doubt in my mind that licensed marijuana sales would make Royal Oak one of the hottest markets in, in Michigan. But Royal Oak's a special place, and I think this city needs to take special measures to ensure the highest quality applicants gain access to this market. With that, I feel the city of Royal Oak needs to take into consideration the following points, which I compiled from my experience with licensing in other communities. One, that city planning applications should include a good neighbor plan. The City of Grand Rapids requires a good neighbor plan as a significant component of a site plan review. Their good neighbor plan includes prime, crime prevention, litter and loitering control, trespass enforcement, landscape maintenance, com maintenance, communications with neighborhoods, and other criteria. I will comment that Grand Rapids is undertaking a major revision of their good neighbor plan because the applicant plans were meeting the paperwork requirements, but in many cases the plans lack meaningful substance. Um, I believe the intent of their good neighbor plan were, um, was supposed to be more contractual in nature, and they're trying to fix that. Two, um, speculative and contingent real estate agreements are restricted to, should be restricted to one property per applicant and subject to full disclosure on the city application. Three, subleasing of properties um, to applicants should be prohibited. Four, application organizations may only apply for one, or, one location and five, a 24-month moratorium should be placed on the sale or transfer of a licensed business that is a going concern from the initial data licensure. I'd also like to uh, caution you on the micro-business license. I think any approach to licensing micro-businesses should be done with great skepticism. Um, while the state has lowered barriers to entry to micro-businesses with licensing fees, I believe there are extremely high, high compliance barriers for these micro-businesses. They're required to be fully vertically integrated and are prohibited from maintaining product from external sources. 
Given my three minutes to present these points, I want to emphasize that there's substantial, back, substantial background information underlying each. Um, I'm not here tonight to either support or oppose anything that's occurring with, with planning. Um, and I would be satisfied with the city's decision to draft a, a no ordinance or to fully opt out of, out, to opt out in accordance with state law. Should the city choose to move forward, I want to impart to you the fact that I've been watching this process very closely. And I want to offer a warning by paraphrasing Virgil, who wrote, be wary of Greeks bearing gifts. Thank you very much. Thank you, Ms. Keppel. See a hand in the far back. Hi, my name's Colleen Duffy. I live at 1007 South Washington. Commissioners, you are asking a lot of the homeowners in my neighborhood. When I walk out my front door, I have construction 50 yards to my left, a proposed construction 10 yards to my right. Well, the construction on my left is an apartment complex that is similar to others in the area and scaled to the lot. The Chin Jewelry Complex is not. The Welcome to Royal Oak sign a block away suggests our corridor should be inviting and architecturally pleasing to the visitors of Royal Oak. Instead, they will be looking at an apartment building that is too dense, too tall, attached to a beautiful building, one I chose to live in. My grandson has a game, Heads Up, Tails Walk. You play it by putting a head of one animal on the body of another animal. If you vote yes on the item number nine of your agenda, you will be putting a frog's head on a horse's body. Please delay construction, keep the architectural integrity of our block, and reduce the size of the building so it fits on the lock. lot. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Duffy. Uh, yes, sir, sir, in the middle here with the blue shirt on. My name is uh, Stephen Miller, 115 Georgetown Square North. So just a couple of items for the taxpayers of, and residents of Royal Oak to think about. Recently, we've had the opportunity to see how two different neighboring cities dealt with basically the same issues, the city of Birmingham and the city of Royal Oak. Each was looking at huge mixed-use combined public and private developments. Each included parking decks. Each had numerous no-bid contracts. Each had no-bid contract issues that were in the tens of millions of dollars. Each had a net loss in parking. Each had architects who were working both sides, the public and the private sides, and working under no-bid contracts. Each saw the developers giving thousands of dollars in political contributions to the mayors, commissioners, and advocates who were supportive of these projects. Each saw tremendous outrage from the taxpayers for the lack of transparency. Each were going to saddle onto the backs of their taxpayers $58 million in bond debt that would not be paid off until 2022 and 2024. Oddly enough, both included this very same developer. Royal Oak taxpayers, this is where you look at the campaign finance reports for Mayor Fournier and the thousands of dollars he has, has had and is receiving from these developers, no-bid contractors, and their family and their friends. However, there is one big, huge, monumental difference between the Royal Oak Civic Center project and the Birmingham combined uh, public and private development. The taxpayers of Birmingham were given the opportunity to vote in a nonpartisan way whether or not they wanted to be hogtied to $58 million in bond debt on a project that was going to produce a net parking loss. The taxpayers of Royal Oak were completely ignored and were not allowed any opportunity to vote. The Birmingham vote was last week and the taxpayers overwhelmingly voted against their elected officials by a 70 to 30 percent margin. Oddly enough, when Royal Oak voters were allowed to vote last fall on those stupid and wasteful bond millages that the mayor and this commission majority pushed for, Royal Oak residents in the same 70% to 30% voted them both down. Sadly, this mayor and commission majority in backroom dealings gave away millions of dollars in taxpayer cash, millions more in valuable city land, and then piled onto our backs millions upon millions of dollars in needless bond debt. There is one large bond rating company that will not even rate Royal Oak's trustworthiness in being able to pay back these millions of dollars in bond debt. 
The Royal Oak taxpayers will finally have a chance to vote, however. This fall, they can vote out Mayor Fournier, Commissioners Dubuck and Perouche, and show these three irresponsible elected officials that it's not okay to give away millions of dollars in taxpayers' money to developer friends, millions of dollars to contractor friends, and millions of dollars in valuable land. With this nonpartisan November election, a very clear message can and will be sent. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Miller. See the rules of public comments still apply. Uh, Mr. Rapinski. So this, this may be a, an opportune time here. Uh, first of all, Mike Rapinski, 3152 Parker uh, in Royal Oak. And uh, uh, Commissioner Macy, I, I, I appreciated your invocation tonight because it, it brought to mind the, the experience my wife and I had in downtown Royal Oak this last weekend as well on Saturday night. We had dinner on one of the wonderful outdoor patios, one of our restaurants. Um, families nearby that were enjoying themselves. It was an exciting night in downtown Royal Oak. We walked around for an hour, and there was just people having fun. And Excuse me, Mr. Rapinski has the floor. Can we be respectful of him as he was respectful of everyone that came to the podium before him? Thank you. So it was a nice night, and we enjoyed it. There were a lot of people just uh, having fun, and uh, I couldn't have been prouder to be a Royal Oaker uh, on, on Saturday night as well. So now what I came to say. <coughs> Our current vibrant downtown and great city neighborhoods are a result of the planning, vision, and leadership of most of our current and past city commissions, as well as city administrations. Everything that has been developed is currently in progress, or what has been proposed has been open and transparent. We have ironclad agreements that ensure that incentives are paid back over time. Our stellar bond rating would not have happened if there was any shred of doubt about the legality of these agreements and unnecessary risk on our city finances. And there has not been one penny of new taxes. I repeat, there has been no new taxes other than for the uh, public safety millage which was voted on overwhelmingly by 70% of our citizens. Amen. Neighboring cities have seen what we are doing and are in admiration of our forward thinking and results. Keep up the good work. Now, I'm going to switch gears and mention something that is disturbing and upsetting. As we all know, we are in an election season, and there is the usual rhetoric from those who would like to see us go in a different direction. They want to take back Royal Oak all the way to the Dark Ages, where downtown was a ghost town and our property values were stagnant. <laughs> And there, is one, please. and there is one among them that has taken to social media and elsewhere with hateful, malicious, and vile personal attacks. We are used to this person's unhinged comments, but recently a line has been crossed. I refer to a veiled racist comment that was made towards a candidate who happens to be a minority. These types of comments have no place in our city and no place in our society. I call on all candidates to denounce this type of rhetoric and to renounce this person's comments for what they are, hateful and racist. Come on, Royal Oak, we're a lot better than that. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Rapinski. Ladies and gentlemen, please we do ask that, you know, we don't clap or applaud because no matter what topic you're discussing, we want to make sure that everyone feels comfortable. Come on, guys. Yes, ma'am. Good evening. I'm Paula Mante from 101 Curry Avenue. Um, I'd like to take a moment to thank our mayor and our city commissioners for the stewardship that they have showed for our city. I know that all of you chose to um, to uh, take on these jobs for not a lot of money. Uh, you're certainly not doing it for the glory, and you're guiding our city to be strong, vibrant, and prosperous. I'm not sure that all of our residents appreciate this and all the work that you do. I know that you all have full-time jobs, you're raising families, and on your side, you know, free time, you're helping to guide our city. Uh, uh, I know I'm very supportive of all the growth that I've seen in the city from the parks to the downtown project. I'd like to thank you for that. Um, I personally chose to move to Royal Oak in 2017. 
uh, because of the city's walkability, the parks and the vibrant downtown area, uh, not, not to mention the beautiful uh, treed neighborhoods. Another important factor that I chose to live here uh, was the diversity of the population. There is a strong sense of community in Royal Oak, of supporting each other and welcoming, accepting, and protecting everyone in this city. The same sense of fostering our community is evident in the work of our mayor, our city commissioners, both past and present. I appreciate all the work that you do. The Human Rights Ordinance passed in 2013 is a shining example of Royal Oak's determination to include and protect all of its citizens. Having said this, to echo our last speaker, I'm extremely disappointed that a very small minority of citizens in Royal Oak feel it necessary to almost on a daily basis sling hateful rhetoric on some of the Royal Oak online forums. Racial and ethnic slurs seem to be the favorite these days, carelessly hurled against many of our citizens, uh, both those running for office and our friends and our neighbors. This demeaning discourse serves no one and it divides our community and fosters hate. I'd like to commend our mayor and our city commissioners for representing all of Royal Oak citizens, for working tirelessly to improve our city, and for leading us by your fine example. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Mante. See a hand in the back, the gentleman in the black sweater. My name is Scott Roberts. I'm a Royal Oak resident. I live at 2125 East Hudson. I also, as of today, just moved one of my businesses here to Royal Oak on Lincoln. I'm here to uh, just try to talk about what I would consider a smart approach to uh, marijuana and how this uh, our city regulates it. I'm a cannabis business attorney. However, I'm not here on anyone's behalf other than my own and of as a resident of the city. I think it would be good if we took a smarter approach and instead of trying to hand out one of a handful of licenses to bigger companies that don't really have any connection to our city, you know, I think a smarter approach would be to allow more of the micro businesses, which are by its very nature much smaller, more mom and pop kind of neighborhood businesses. And the reason why I think that would be better is not just because I think it better fit with Royal Oak and the community that it is, but also because it would lead to a lot more money for our city. You know, a micro business is by its very nature much smaller than a retail dispensary. It maybe would do a third of the revenue that a retail dispensary would be, meaning a city of our size can support many more of these businesses. However, a key distinction is that when it's coming to determining Royal Oak's share of the excise tax, that we would all get, micro business and the dispensary license, they count the same. So if we were to say allow three dispensary licenses and hand them out to big companies making promises that to be honest with you, they probably won't all keep, we could do that or we could hand nine micro businesses out to more local business people who live or work in the city and we would get three times the amount of excise tax revenue we're talking extra hundreds of thousands of dollars. Um, this is the type of revenue that could maybe mean we don't have to have a millage next time. So I'm here just to try to educate you guys on that. I'm more than happy to answer any questions you may have um, in the future on the micro business license. It's something I'm personally very interested in, and I think something that's a really good fit for our city. And I think just generally it's something that in the longer term, you know, it's going to mean more money. I also think it's going to be better for our community having more neighborhood businesses as opposed to, you know, a handful or two or three large businesses that are really just here to extract as much money from our community as possible. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Roberts. I see a hand in the middle here. Yes, ma'am. Good evening, Mr. Mayor, Commissioners. Terry Myers, 1915 Roland Avenue. Um, I'm going to skip through some of this. Uh, the residents that were up here complaining about what's on social media and um, the hatefulness and things like that. I just want to point out that, yes, I am part of the ROAR group. Um, there was a, a, a note in social media that says we all go drinking at the Dixie Moon Saloon before coming here, and they called it Dutch Courage, I believe it was. I believe that's defamation of character, but whatever. Um, 
we don't, we are not against developments. It's how they are um, gone about, like the 5.5 million to Boji, the dollar parking lot sell. Um, I'm asking residents to look at the facts. Don't vote on name recognition. Actually look and see what's going on with your tax dollars. Um, I congrat Birmingham to um, shutting down that uh, Boji deal two to one. Uh, you rave about your AA bond rating. I remember it used to be AAA. Um, I'm going to point out Campbell again. I think Campbell should have been considered a one lane in each way and a bike lane after the 75 project was done. I don't think I-75 had anything to do with it because Campbell is a busy traveled road down there by 10 mile. Um, I'm guessing it's gonna get worse once the school year starts. We started getting a lot of traffic down our side streets still. Still a half a mile back up from 10 mile to Lincoln. Um, Mr. Gillum, if you're gonna step up as interim city manager, thank you. Appreciate that. And I am hoping that you will allow um, the on street handicap parking to be at no cost when you vote on that. That's all I have. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Myers. Mr. Harrison. Thank you, Mayor, Commis Commissioners. Uh, Bill Harrison, 2729 Trafford. Uh, in addition to my prepared uh, statements. Uh, this business of turning around the uh, downtown, I've owned commercial property in downtown Royal Oak since the mid-1980s. And you socialists sure as hell weren't the ones that turned this city around. It was a far more conservative commission, and at that time, was just mentioned, we had a triple-A bond reading. So let's not, as Joe Biden says, uh, confuse things with... Uh, Truth versus facts. Anyway. On the uh, the, uh, the uh, marijuana issue, it's been the general consensus uh, not to have marijuana uh, dispensaries downtown, and I, I applaud that. But my question is, why have them in the city of Royal Oak at all? We've noticed our surrounding communities have said no, and even most recently, Highland Park. What a surprise. They've said no. We don't need this business in downtown. I have no problem with medical marijuana, but let's put it in the hands of the professionals, the pharmaceuticals, and treat it like any other controlled substance. The last, the last item, I, I've heard a rumbling that this cockamamie scheme of using drones to fly over to, to figure out this um, uh, water runoff uh, issue I've done a little bit of checking, haven't had a lot of time to uh, spend on it, but uh, I, all I've found so far is that Berkeley and Birmingham are the only ones that, that have a, a set fee for, uh, and it's based on a, what they call equivalent uh, residential uh, unit. And when you look at the water and uh, sewer disposal uh, rates, Royal Oak is the highest. We're 35 to 40 percent above all others. It represents almost 32 percent of our entire water bill. The um, combined water and sewage bills of 10 communities, um, Huntington Woods is, is the highest, Royal Oak is next, and all others are significantly less than Royal Oak. So I'd like to hear a little bit about it and have you put on some kind of a, a program or whatever to tell us what's going on with this runoff. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Harrison. All right, who's next? Yes, ma'am, here in the front. Hi, uh, my name is Carolyn March. I live at uh, 918 East 14 Mile, north end of the city. This is totally unprepared, but I have spoken in front of council before. My concern is <clears throat> I see quite a few uh, landscape companies blowing the cuttings and the you know, we're at the end of summer, so grass cutting is going to come to a minimum. But we're heading into fall with all the leaves and everything, and this is going into our drains. Uh, we have had, I've lived in Royal Oak, I don't know, 13, 14 years. Um, 
four or five water main breaks within this time frame. Are we looking into our infrastructure? You know, is code enforcement driving around the city? When I came to report, I came to pay my taxes. I saw within one mile on Crooks Road, two different companies blowing the stuff into the street. Who cares, just blowing the street, saving some sweep time. Um, when I went to code enforcement, they want to know, you know, name, date, place. I don't know this. I live on the north side. My husband cuts our grass. Um, does code enforcement, you know, traverse the city just to look for these infractions? That's my concern. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Marks. I see a hand right here. Yes, it's been up for a while. On the right. Can't see a face. It's not both. Ellen Napo, 1841 Chester Road. Um, well, I wasn't going to speak today until I heard the radio this morning, and um, so here's my here's my little statement in appreciation. Um, commissioners are paid twenty dollars per meeting. They don't have to do things like spend their morning on a radio show answering questions live about hot button issues in their cities, issues like the road died and bike lanes that grind the gears of more than a few residents. That's why I was so pleased this morning that. Um, a representative from the commission, am I allowed to say who that was? Um, Commissioner DeBuck was on Detroit today along with other guests to hopefully explain things in a way that people could hear instead of fighting about and trolling each other on social media. A brave move if you ask me. Here's what I took away from the discussion. The process of initiating the road diet began 10 years ago. So I learned that none of the commissioners was on the commission, the, on, None of the current commissioners was on the commission at that time. Commissioner DeBuck explained that he wasn't originally sold on the idea. He had to be convinced. And I for, I, for one, am glad he was. The city consulted with experts and conducted studies. City officials met with residents. And they concluded that the road diet, which includes bike lanes, would improve safety for everyone. My two cents is that in the big picture, complete streets improves life for all residents. Furthermore, bike friendly does not mean car hating. And I don't even own a bike, so I have no personal stake in that. However, the initiative is relatively new and a work in progress. The timing of lights at some intersections may, have to have, may need to be adjusted. We'll figure out the best version of the road diet, but while I believe the majority appreciates its benefits, there are those who will remain chronically unhappy. I imagine when you become a public servant, you have to accept that and do what's best to your best ability. I believe Commissioner DeBuck and his colleagues who champion the road diet are doing just that right now. So I learned some things about the road diet this morning and drew a few conclusions for myself, like how lucky we are in Royal Oak to have a commissioner like Kyle DeBuck who will take time to listen to the feedback of residents and address their concerns in such a public forum on his own time. Hey, Ms. Napo. Mr. Karlowski. <coughs> Karlowski, 419 Virginia. Uh, first off, I'm talking, I want to talk about the uh, tree company for next year. I don't know if that's the incumbent. I hope not, because I would like you all to come to 419 Virginia and see the tree that was planted in my right of way. And it's been a, been a joke to everybody I've seen. It looks like it was grown on its side for at least two years. I have asked the, the arborist to come and take a look at it, see if anything can be done to, to trim it up to get it somewhat symmetrical. But if that's what we're paying for, uh, we need to certainly take a look at what we're getting for our money. Uh, the other thing, since the folks, some folks have, have uh, kind of lambasted anybody who disagrees with this commission, uh, no, we are not trying to roll up the sidewalks precisely at 10. We do not, uh, we're not looking for a dry downtown. We do have a problem with the way money is spent. We have a problem with $5.5 million of general fund money going to a private investor who is never going to pay that back to the general fund by your own calculations. That means, like, never, okay? Uh, also, uh, there's been some kind of insinuation that if you disagree with the city commission uh, you, or you call out somebody, you're racist and bigoted. No, 
I am not racist or bigoted. I have, in fact, uh, there's been a, a, a certain attorney in this town who likes to make personal attacks on people. I guess if you run for commission, you gotta, you gotta take, take the shots. But I find it, if you wanna go down the road, folks, trust me, there's enough ammunition from everybody that we can go on, all right? So if you wanna go personal, we can go. Um, the other the other thing that I want to try and, uh, is uh, there's been a lot of, of statements last time about how we're doing exactly what Oakland County did in the pensions. Uh, no, we're not, because when the Oakland County converted, they had everybody go on a defined, uh, defined contribution plan before they took everything else out. You guys didn't, okay? So now you still have the multiplier growing. They also did it a heck of a lot sooner than you guys did. Uh, and there was also a statement that, gee, uh, we're bringing the, the indebtedness that we have out in the open. Well, congratulations. Uh, I hope you added the other 60 million that you have for police and fire. But my question is, if we're that indebted, why are we going further in debt? Okay, you would think that you would wanna call down your debt and not continue to raise it up if you already have $123 million in debt for your, for your uh, pension liability in OPEP. And finally, um, there was a statement that, 13 seconds, huh? Okay, there was a statement that we're gonna get a $2 million cash flow. Well, if you make enough assumptions, you can go to the moon on a trampoline. I would suggest you take a look at what the underlying assumptions are for that $2 million cash flow, because I don't think you're gonna be getting it with the, as, you, as the changes in the, uh, uh, how long people live, and I think we're already lost $5 million just because of the changes in the assumption. Uh, so we're now $5 million less in, in pension, in their pension fund than we were before. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Karlowski. Once again, it's, it's my duty to remind you, you know, public comment, the rules are made not by this commission, but by the community. And there, Mr. Karlowski makes his points. There may be other people that disagree, and we don't want to discourage or um, have anyone feel that they're not welcome to come up here and speak their mind if they have an opposing opinion. That's why we kind of ask that, you know, applause and clapping, you know, uh, be avoided and not, um, not used in this forum. So we appreciate your cooperation. Uh, Mr. Wolf. Ron Wolf, 333 North Troy Street. I'm a proud Jew from Brooklyn, and I want you to know I lived in New Rochelle, New York, where my biology teacher, Ann Schwerner's son, was killed by the Ku Klux Klan. And for anyone to even insinuate that I am a racist is absolutely insane. Okay? It doesn't make any sense. Now, Eighty. Now, I want to point out about ma marijuana, jewels, these jewels things, that the, these uh, vaping shops. These, if these marijuana, recreational marijuana shops are going to carry THC oil, now I'm not talking CBD, THC is the, what makes you high. If, you, if, if the people that are vaping this, you can, there is no odor. You can't even tell they're smoking marijuana. Is this what you want for your downtown? 80, 50, $58 million just spent supposedly to attract major corporations and professionals to open businesses in Royal Oak. And like a two-year-old child passing an ice cream shop, you suddenly change your mind and decide to go with mar recreational marijuana? Are you nuts? Okay. Now, this is not a personal attack, Bellum. But I just want to point out some facts. Don't judge a book by its cover. Beware of Greeks bearing gifts, especially on Troy by the farmer's market. Be birds of a feather tend to fly together. These are maxims. These are old maxims. Bella Morales, in my opinion, was drafted by Don Johnson, possibly his parting shot. And of course, Mayor Fournier, Commissioner Majority Members Dubuck, Perouche, who brought us reduced public comment, former mayor and state rep Jim Ellison, who brought us John, Ron Bolge, Jim Razor, who we all know, and unions employed by Ron Bolge, including grateful residents who worked for this no-bid bait, bait and switch from a class A office structure 
to a hospital clinic rehab, just what Royal Oak really needs to be known for. Bellum, in my opinion, was drafted to target resident first limit commissioner Randy Lavasser. Think of how the millions in bond debt could have been better spent to e expand our library, the farmer's market, and create a downtown park that would be the envy of the county, as well as to expand the senior center and beautify our parks, instead of squandering millions to stuff the pockets of Mr. Bolgi and, the, and contractors that know how to butter a slice of bread. Royal Oak could have been made into a city you only dream about. This is the shameful legacy of Don Johnson and the present commission majority you and your children will have to pay for. In Mr. Spades, Wolf, I do need you to finish your last point, sir. Bella Morales makes no mention of handicapped parking or what, she, or what happened to seniors at Royal Oak Manor. You understand that, what I just said? Thank you, Mr. Wolf. Vote for Stephen Miller, Randy Lavasser, Tom Halleck, and Pamela Lindell across the board. Please, residents, do not allow this commission to do to you what they did to the residents of Royal Oak Manor. Thank you, Mr. Wolf. All right, so the rules of public comment of not applauding. I'll remind everyone again. The reason why we have those rules is because there may be people that have an opposing opinion, and we don't want to discourage our neighbors, our family, our friends from coming up here and feeling uh, uncomfortable with any sort of implied hostility. So I ask once again if we can be respectful of each other and just hold off from applauding. It's not a show here. This is a public meeting. Thank you. Um, yes, sir, here in the corner. I see. Yes. I see an arm. Hi, my name is William Asher. I reside at 1003 Irving in the south end of Royal Oak. And I just wanted to say how much I appreciate what the commission has done, uh, in particular with the downtown development. Uh, I think it's going really well. And uh, I've used the, the garage on 11th Mile. It's a great garage. I was at the, I was at the farmer's market on Saturday, and uh, it seemed really busy to me. I know there were uh, concerns that the development would ruin the market. And I, I don't know for a fact whether it's doing better or worse, but it just seemed real busy and vibrant. And it was, of course, one of the things that I love about living in Royal Oak. Um, I'm looking forward to the park. It's going to be a small park, but it'll be a nice park from what I've seen from the preliminary designs. And, um, and of course, the new, the new city hall and, uh, and police department. It's all going to be a, a, a great downtown, I think. Thank, Thank you. you, Mr. Hesher. All right. I see this gentleman here has had his hand up for a while. I just want to complain about the fact that uh, we have a library in Royal Oak, and I like our library, but I end up going to other cities because every time I want to go to the library, I'm going to have to pay five bucks these days. It keeps going up and up. It was. You know, I could usually find spots before at Farmer's Market, but now with the new system you have here, it's, you know, take the new parking structure and five bucks. Thanks. I don't see how that serves our, our citizens and the, the library. Thank, Thank you. Mr. Diner. All right. Who's next? Oh, in the back, actually. Yes, ma'am. In the orange. I think it's orange. I can't tell from... The lighting's weird back there. It's, it's not as bad as a uh, white dress, purple dress, or whatever that uh, controversy was. But. Okay. Um, hi, my name is Sue Campy, and I live uh, at 1011 South Washington. And I'm up here um, to talk about the proposal, uh, I think it's number nine, for the property on Hudson in Washington for the micro apartments that are going to be built there. I just moved here. I don't have any background or history with Royal Oak. I moved here because I think it's a beautiful city, and you, you're, you're the commission, and everywhere around me I see beautiful new construction buildings being built. So I assume, I, I attribute that to the decisions you guys have made. 
I moved into one of them, South Washington. It's an absolutely beautiful building with a beautiful view, a rooftop uh, townhouses that look at the city of Royal Oak. As residents there, we found out after we moved in by hearsay that, that this proposal had already been passed once and, to the, and it needed a second vote, which is tonight. And we really never got notification, which is part of the procedure you're supposed to follow. So like you ask us to follow the rules in here, I don't understand why you didn't follow the rules about right procedure and letting people within 300 feet know. I don't understand why you're approving something. Ladies and gentlemen, please, she has the floor. Why you're approving something that violates the ordinance that you guys created to protect property owners and to protect communities and neighborhoods. And this building, the building they're building, I have no problem with it. It's, it's pretty. It can be built somewhere, but it's too high, 43 feet, and it's too dense for the lot, and you're jamming it next to a beautiful building <coughs> that Colleen said, rightly so, architecturally, you've diminished the Washington property now. I've talked to three realtors and said, is my property value going to go down with this? And I showed them the picture of it and what, what it's being, the density of it and the lack of parking, 63 parking spaces when code said there should be 96. Where's the overflow going to go? My, the three realtors confirmed that our property value will go down because of this building. So can there be a compromise? Can you still build there and, and follow the ordinances? Only go third. 30 feet, have retail in the bottom, don't put 48 units in a 14,000 square foot property that goes from end to end and then drilling underground to go into parking down there. Please, you don't need to do this. Royal Oak's beautiful. The decisions you've made are beautiful. Why are you doing this? And I would say for myself, everything I read about the new buildings, they, every one of them says, we're trying to attract young professionals, young professionals. Where's the diversity? What about me, the old professional? What about the middle-aged professionals? We want to live here and be part of Royal Oak, too. I see everyone in this room is very passionate. They all have different opinions, maybe, but they're passionate about this city. And I look at them, I don't see many young professionals in that group. These people care. I care. Please, please listen. And please do not vote on this tonight. Give us time and give yourselves time to do the right thing. I ask you, please. Thank you, Ms. Campbell. See a hand in the back? Yes. Sure, if you hand them to the clerk, she'll be able to pass them down to us. Hello everyone, my name is Jean Hanna. I'm speaking to exercise my right and voice my concern as a resident of the city of Royal Oak. We reside at 1005 South Washington, which is the first unit closest to Hudson Street and closest proximity adjoined to the new development of 1003 South Washington Avenue in downtown Royal Oak. Unfortunately, the new proposed development will completely obstruct our view, invade our privacy, and decrease our overall property value. We understand that Royal Oak is a developing and booming city, which is why we chose to settle and invest in property here over other cities. The reason we chose to buy this unit is for the privacy and beautiful view that, the, that it offered of the city. We understand the development can be completely stopped, but there should be consideration for neighboring residents, the current residents whose property value is anywhere from $750,000 to $1 million. At this point, we have invested and paid premium dollars for our unit, and it is a shame and very frustrating to know that the new building will be within arm's reach of our privacy and property. What we have envisioned for our home and our future is being completely taken away by this. We always look forward to new developments in Royal Oak. However, there should be regulations on building height to accommodate existing building and residents. We really are hoping that you guys are understanding where we're coming from. I, I gave some pictures. I mean, honestly, 
it, it really does make me so sad that this is being built because one of the main reasons why we chose this unit is because of the beautiful view. And it's not just one view, it's three different views. And it's not affecting just, you know, my household, but other people too. And, and truly, I do love Royal Oak. I've worked here for 12 years. Um, I've lived in Royal Oak for five years, and I really do love bringing people to Royal Oak, but I just feel like we're being dissed by this whole thing. I don't mean to put other people down, but these condos are very expensive, and we chose to live here for a reason. I just don't think it's right to just put a brick wall in front of us or have people, you know, I can literally touch the new um, apartment building, and I just think it's just unfair. So I'm, I'm truly begging you to just think about this, go over it, not make a decision right away. There's going to be 48 apartments. And if you if you know where Tin Jewelry is, it's a very small area. What about all the parking? I mean, I, I've been here for so long. I know how bad the parking situation is. There's going to be huge issues with parking if this goes on. So I'm begging you to just think about this and, and think about the people that are in these condos already. Thank you so much. Thank you, Ms. Hannah. All right, who's next? I see a hand here in the aisle. I don't see a face. I can see a hand. Yes, ma'am. Erica Sykes, 325 Lexington Boulevard. Um, I am a member of Royal Oakers for Accountability and Responsibility, otherwise known as ROAR. And I want to clear up the misconception about who makes up ROAR and what our purpose is. There is an organized group that many of you belong to and that are trying to portray us as being a partisan group, specifically a Republican group who spread baseless accusations of corruption and incompetence of our commission majority. This is a gross misrepresentation of who we are, and because they cannot refute the facts, this group instead tries to discredit us. Knowledge is power, and we are dedicated to ensuring our fellow neighbors know the facts so that they vote on issues and not per a party platform. We will not be bullied into silence. I am here tonight to introduce you to some of our war members. If you guys can stand or raise your hand. We are Democrats, we are Republicans, we are independents. We are young and we are young at heart. We are straight, we are gay, we are empty nesters, and we are young families. In short, we are true representation of the diverse demographics that make up Royal Oak. We are your neighbors and we stand together for a common cause to help make a positive change in Royal Oak by educating our fellow residents and neighbors what is going on in their local government. What brings us together is not whether we subscribe to any one political philosophy over another. It is the issues that Royal Oak faces that have unified us. Our commission majority has been relying on the public's apathy and ignorance to institute almost $60 million in new bond debt for a city center project without allowing a vote <coughs> from the residents to reward lucrative no-bid contracts to their political donors and to sell not one but two revenue-generating surface parking lots for only a dollar each. Further proof that residents' interests are not a priority for this commission majority is what their actions have done to our beloved farmer's market and the reduction of traffic lanes on some of our busiest streets in favor of underutilized bike lanes. These are just some of the issues that we feel residents need to know about and think about when they go out out to vote. So when you think of Roar and who we are, understand that we are your neighbors. We are asking you to vote on the issues and not base your vote on political partisanship. Actions speak louder than words, and the actions of the sitting commission majority should concern all the citizens of Royal Oak. I ask that citizens please vote for a positive change, for candidates that will put Royal Oak needs first and not blindly vote a party line. Please vote for Stephen Miller for mayor, Tom Halleck, Pam Lindell, and Randy Andy Lavoisier for city commissioner. Thank you. All right, I guess I, I guess the plea to uh, you know, show respect for people with uh, differing opinions is is not going to be uh, received well tonight. So uh, we'll go with Mr. Colo up here. Member of the commission, I am Brandon Colo, 600 East Hudson Avenue. Um, so tonight I came out because we have a lot of cool issues on the agenda tonight. 
first off, which I think is extremely important, you guys are appointing a new interim city manager. Um, Mr. Gillum is extremely good at what he does, and I'm excited to see how he can lead the city for the next couple of months while you choose someone else. Next, you have a big development going on on South Washington Avenue. You've heard from people tonight who might not feel good about it. You also have some developers out in the hallway who want to bring in hundreds of new rural locals to town. So I think there's a good give and take on what we can accomplish with that. Um, we're talking about sidewalks. You guys are talking about how to renew the sidewalk program. Clearly the ballot failed. We need to go on and improve the sidewalk somehow. And then you talk about medical marijuana, or I'm sorry, just recreational marijuana in town. So there's a lot of substance stuff on the agenda tonight. But then we have people standing up tonight and trying to run from office from this podium, which is really just disheartening. Um, two people had to say, I'm not racist tonight. The last person who just got up had to, she talked about issues and voting, and she actually called voters ignorant, but then forgot to mention any issue that's on the, the agenda tonight. So I'm really happy we have people actually up here leading and doing stuff, and I really wish that when people came to the podium, they would talk about issues that are really matter, that matter, and not just political fodder. Because all day, I'm, I'm sorry. Would someone else Ladies and speak? gentlemen, Mr. Colo has the floor. I don't remember Mr. Colo interrupting anybody else that was here at the podium. So again, I kindly ask for your respect. As respect is given, it should be received. Thank you. Like I said, I'm just here tonight to listen to the good debate that's gonna be had at this table. And I look forward to what you guys have to say. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Colo. Who's next? I see in the back a hand, gentleman in the white shirt. Good afternoon, commissioners. Uh, my name is Richard Sulak. I am not a resident of the city of Royal Oak. I'm actually a resident of the city of Warren, but I'm an attorney here representing the um, residents of the Washington um, I guess condo development uh, next to which the proposed item agenda nine development would be going up. Uh, you've heard some of them speak today um, about their frustration with the process uh, by which this uh, council, um, or by which rather they felt that they've been railroaded um, with which is, uh, I guess, development is gonna go through. And I wanted to bring to the attention that um, each one of the individuals in that development um, would be ready to stand before you and give an affidavit that they weren't given proper notice under the city ordinance. Specifically, um, it would be part two, article three, subsection 770, uh, paragraph 13, uh, procedures for public hearing. And I hope that someone is uh, recording this, um, but it specifically says that a public hearing date shall be set and notification published in at least one newspaper of general circulation within the city sent by mail or personal delivery to the owners of the property for which approval is being considered and to all persons to whom real property is assessed within 300 feet of the property and to the occupants of the structures within 300 feet of the property, regardless of whether the property or occupant is located in the zoning jurisdiction. Um, I understand and recognize the balance um, that, and the challenge that each one of you face um, with wanting to go and help move this city forward. Uh, I myself am currently a candidate for the city of Warren City Council, so I know um, having an impassioned resident is uh, one of the challenges of the office, but one of the most important things um, that keep us from being um, any other type of government are the rules and regulations that we have in place. And so I would just ask um, respectfully and also put this commission on notice that if um, the vote were to proceed today without the proper procedure being followed, that it would um, potentially open this commission and the developer up to litigation um, for not following those procedures. Um, so by and large, the agreement as it was stated, um, as you guys will notice in that agreement, it makes a statement that um, you guys do not have notice of any pending or threatened litigation um, that would make that statement false. And so as a measure to at least allow these developers to have a conversation with the residents and the voters of your community, I would request that you table this uh, to allow this discussion to go further. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Sulaka. All right, who's next? In the back, Mr. Reddy.
Uh, Arvind Reddy, 618 South Pleasant. Sorry, I didn't prepare anything, but it's just been difficult hearing you guys slandered up here for no good reason. And I just wanted to say that there are thousands of people like me who like to live in a city with really strong and growing property values that's safe, and they're not here speaking because they're out enjoying the great city that we're lucky to live in. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Reddy. All right, anybody else wish to speak tonight? Going once, going twice. Okay, I see a hand back there first. <coughs> Quick draw. Ms. Harrison. Hi, good evening. Good evening, Laura Harrison. I live at the, in the same house as Mr. Harrison. <laughs> I have lived here since 1972. I've had a business here. I've raised two boys here and a granddaughter half of the time. Anyhow, um, I really only came to talk about one thing that really bothers me as a former city commissioner, and that is our bond rating. I feel that that is one of the most important assets to this city. When I was on the commission, we were triple A always, and we kept that triple A. And I don't know when it went down to a double A. Plus. But it, I hope we never have anything more like what we had five years ago, almost to the day, our wonderful flood we had. That was a pretty big catastrophe for our city. And if we have something come along, God knows what, tornado, whatever, and we have massive damage in this city, where are we going to borrow money from with a triple, excuse me, a double A rating? We need to get back up to a triple A rating and stay there. Pay the bills. Thank you, Ms. Harrison. I guess they're here in the front. My name is... Eric Schaefer, 723 East 11 Mile. And uh, haven't been to a commission meeting in quite a while, read the paper, pay attention, but there's quite a bit of difference of opinion about a lot of things in this city. And uh, I've lived here uh, more than 40 years, know a lot of people. And I'll give you a viewpoint that you haven't heard from anybody here. I know an awful lot of business people. 40 years and more, you get to know a lot of people. There's an undercurrent in the city of people who have businesses and are residents that have no intention to come here and speak because this there's a, there's a flavor that's permeating large segments of Royal Oak that this is not a good place to speak out because the administration does not like dissenters. And so there's an awful lot of people that don't go along, but they're not going to speak out because they're in positions where they're at some jeopardy. And you should realize that there's an arrogance about the demeanor of this commission in many, many subjects for a long time. Not today, not this month. This has been going on a long time. And it's everything from the growth of the government to this whole new city center deal. You know, the, the entire city used to run in this business, in this building. Fifteen years ago, we had to build the courthouse. Somehow we couldn't manage. We had to build that edifice. It's, it's glorious. You can't really get in there, but, you know, they, you walk in the front and get a sense that it's a nice place. Now... We're running the whole city here, and I would encourage all residents that haven't been to City Hall, find time to come to City Hall 
walk through the building, go up to some windows. We have great staff. The staff is cooperative, helpful. They're in a building that is meticulously maintained, meticulous. And we run one of the best cities in the area. But no, this isn't good enough for this group. We need a brand new building, $60 million of debt. And of course, such calculations are always done in error. There's unanticipated problems. And then we're going to knock this building down. So it's just spend, spend, spend. I've watched this for a lot of years. This didn't just percolate. up. I just decided to say it because there's obviously a lot of disagreeers here at this, at this, this commission meeting. There's a hell of a lot more that are not coming to the party and they're not going to say anything because they fear multiple layers of retribution. I won't go any deeper, but I know about it. One of the big things is the zoning exemptions people get. I'm in a commercial zoned area. You guys have approved residential all over that area, all over the place. Mr. Schaefer, yeah. I do need you to finish your last yes. thought, sir. Yes. And, and so this, this idea that you come hat in hand and you ask, and, and guess what? You, you can get, if you do it right, you can get the exemptions, and then they authorize stuff. People should look at a street called Mason Court. The city commissioned a, a duplex in Mr. there. Mr. Schaefer, I really do need you okay. to finish up your last Thank point, you. Sir. Appreciate it. The exceptions that you come and you ask for and you routinely grant are not helping the residents of the city. They're helping the new customers. Thank you. Thank Mr. you Schaefer. for your time. All right, who's next? Sir in the back. Hi, I'm David Alsop. I live at 1018 East 12 Mile. I've been a resident of uh, Royal Oak since 1963 when I was a kid and went over to Northwood School. So I've got some history here. Um, I'm pretty relaxed. I haven't even tied my shoes to come up here. Uh, I wasn't expecting to speak. <laughs> but I thought, well, given all of the controversy that's going on and the issue with the bonds and the debt, I think that the city's mismanaged. And here's what I'm waiting for. And I've made money buying defaulted bonds, uh, so uh, revenue bonds and general obligation bonds. I'm looking forward to the day Royal Oak goes bankrupt, and I'll come in, and I'll buy up the $228 million in bonds you've got for one or two cents on the dollar. Then you'll be in receivership, and you'll have to negotiate with me. So I think we've all got something to look forward to, and uh, that's what I'm looking forward to. Thank you. All right, who's next? Going once. Okay, in the back, sir. Uh, Gary Lloyd, uh, 432 South Washington. I wasn't going to speak, but after listening to all this patrol, I actually came because I've been watching this on TV, and I really kind of get upset at how you all are, like, beat over the heads all the time as a commission. And in response to a, a previous speaker, there is a large number of people who actually support <laughs> what you're doing, the actions that you have taken, and moving the city forward. And I just want to applaud you as a commission for the voices that didn't show up, because it's easier to like complain than to give you accolades. So I'm here to say, job well done. Thank you, Mr. Lee. Who's next? I thought I saw another hand. Going once, going twice. Yes, ma'am. This refers, oops. <coughs> Linda Tumala, 3021 Helen Court. I wish to speak about the bike lanes. Um, it seems to be an example of pleasing a few at the expense of many. Inconvincing, inconven, inconven, many. For 38 years, we lived on Lexington. To keep active, I walk. 
it was always possible to cross over Main to walk toward Rochester, even with four lanes of traffic <coughs> without the common areas. Two years ago, we moved near 30 Mile and Crooks. Often I would cross Crooks to walk on Royal and Butternut. Since, since the change in Maine to bike lanes and only one lane in each direction, human, human beings, being what they are, look for a faster route. And so now on Main Street, the traffic has shifted to Crooks and Rochester. I can speak of Crooks. The traffic volume has increased so that it is dense two lanes most all of the day. It is more like Woodward, both in density and speed. Traffic is like water. It finds a path of least resistance. Why put up with 25 miles an hour on Main when you can go 35 or 45 on Crooks? It has been reported that Main is a study. Hopefully, it will be reversed so that the, the increase in traffic in today's world will follow more <coughs> equally between our three main streets, north and south arteries, Rochester, Maine, and Crooks. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Moore. All right, who's next? All right, going once, going twice. We are going to close public comment. We'll bring the discussion back to this side of the table. Thank you for everyone for participating in public comment. Uh, this brings us to item number seven, which is the approval of the agenda. Commissioner Macy. So move approval. We have a motion by Commissioner Macy. We have a second by Commissioner Pruch. Discussion? All right. With none, I'll call for the vote. All those in favor say aye. 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 Those opposed? Motion passes. All right. That brings us to item number eight, the consent agenda. Does anyone wish to pull anything off the consent agenda this evening? Does anyone wish to make a motion on the consent agenda? Commissioner Perush. I'll move approval of the consent agenda. We have a motion by Commissioner Perush. We have a second by Commissioner Douglas. The consent agenda consists of City Commission meeting minutes from July 22, 2019. Uh, City Commission special meeting minute work session from July 22, 2019. City Commission special meeting minutes July 29, 2019. Claims for July 30th, August 2nd, and August 13th, 2019. Approval of purchase order. Declaration and approval of surplus property, final award of police station, trade contract work, approval of downtown Detroit partnership bike share program with MOGO agreements, notice of road closure, Delamere Boulevard and Nakata Road for Consumers Energy Corporation transmission line repair, contract modification, CAP 1801, 2018 concrete, pa concrete pavement replacement and prepaid sidewalk improvement program, contract modification to S1802, 2018 sewer lining, Contract modification, B1302, heating, ventilation, and air conditioning, Royal Oak Public Library, word of contract, CAP 1846, street tree planting program, approval of Commission for the Arts, Art Explored Agreements, uh, and receive and file the non-action items, which consists of the July 2019 investment report. Discussion? All right, with none, I'll call for the vote. All those in favor say aye. 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 Those opposed? Motion passes. This brings us to item number nine, which is the Planning Commission recommendation on rezoning 1003 South Washington Avenue, second reading. Mayor, Mr. members of the commission, uh, this is the second reading. Uh, the city commission did hold its first reading uh, back on June 24th. Um, it's not on the consent agenda uh, because it was not a unanimous uh, vote at that, that meeting. Uh, I wasn't planning a, a long uh, presentation on it other than to remind you that it's a uh, uh, a recommendation from the Planning Commission to approve the rezoning from mixed use two uh, to planned unit development. Uh, basically, it's a residential project uh, with some uh, small area of commercial space on the northwest corner of the first floor. Uh, they are proposing a mix of studio, one bedroom, and two bedroom units, a uh, total of 48, uh, along with uh, parking under underground. Uh, the building is four stories or 43 feet to the uh, roof line. Questions for Mr. Twain? Commissioner Dubot. Yeah, just before we really even dig in on this, I just want to uh, address something that was raised to public comment. Was uh, all, all the meetings, uh, were they all properly noticed uh, in accordance with law? The only, the only required public hearing is in front of the Planning Commission, and notice was given to that. Uh, there is no requirement for public hearing at this body uh, unless you ask for one. Okay. So the, the planning meeting was noticed? Yes. 
How many meetings, how, how many times did planning discuss this issue? Uh, I believe there was only one. There was the one public hearing, then our first reading, and then this meeting? Right. Okay. Thanks. Thank you, talk, Commissioner Pruch. I had the same question. I know that the public um, hearing at the Plan Commission was attended by residents, so I'm assuming that resident notices were sent out. Um, I think the people that spoke tonight were at, in the condo association. Are notices sent to the condo association individual owners? I would assume so, and I'm assuming that that happened in this case, but can we be sure that that happened? Generally, there's a notice sent out to all the property owners within 300 feet. Uh, as well as if there's an occupant address, we send it to the occupant as well. Uh, sometimes it's the same person. Um, but yeah, I can give you the list of who got notice. We keep that list, there's a map. But in terms of a condo association, would the notice have gone to the condo association office? One, if there was a separate office there, it would have, but it would also have gone to each unit. If okay. they're I guess I would just like to be sure that we got notice to each of those units. Well, I can go back and get the list if you want to wait 10 minutes, and I can tell you everybody that's on it. Yeah, that would be helpful. Ladies and gentlemen, the meeting's on this side of the table. Please be respectful. I, I, I'm pretty sure we noticed everybody that needs notice or was supposed to get notice. <clears throat> that was the question I had. Any other questions for Mr. Twing? Commissioner Dubuck. Yeah, uh, last time I don't think we heard from the uh, the petitioner. I'm wondering if he's present, if we want to allow him a chance to address the project and some of the uh, uh, concerns that have been raised and, and what their, their vision is and why they uh, believe they uh, uh, should be granted these um, various, uh, these very variances. Allow that to happen if there's a motion to do so. So moved. A motion by Commissioner Dubuck, second by Commissioner Douglas. Any discussion? All right, I'll call for the vote. All those in favor say aye. 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 Those opposed? Okay, motion passes. Gentlemen. Well, thank you. Uh, <coughs> me. Thank you for giving us an opportunity to speak to you regarding this development. Uh, first of all, I'd like to say um, this development is uh, kind of speaks for itself. I think it's an amazing. One second, sir. I, I, sure. I apologize. City Attorney reminded me if you could state your name. Sure. And, uh, Gabe Rubin. Berkeley Realty Group and Royal Oak Development Company. Thank you, Gabe. 230 East Harrison Avenue, Royal Oak. Um, so I think this, this development absolutely speaks for itself. Uh, first thing, as you all know, uh, the city of Royal Oak hired a third party to conduct a target market housing report, which I thought it was a very detailed, well done report. Um, in this report, it clearly identified the types of housing that uh, is needed and essentially is a shortage uh, within the city. This specific area, um, 1003 South Washington, f fell within an area according to the target market housing report um, of exactly what... Uh, was proposed is proposed a dense densely populated micro style apartment unit and um, that's that's exactly what this type of product is uh, the other thing I'd like to say is um, we are actively working on a green roof system uh, we're planning on installing and uh, reducing the total amount of water into the systems by about 20 percent so we're we're very excited about that brian howard with hf architecture at 512 north main street in royal oak and just some history my business and company has, has been in downtown royal oak for almost 20 years and so i care about royal oak the projects i get involved with i feel are strong and need to be um projects that create diversity, create different size units. We have two bedroom units, one, as Tim stated, two bedroom, one bedroom and studio units. Our relationship of our building to the neighbor to our south 
is actually 17 feet lower than that building is. Also, the volume of our building is half the size of what their building is. So there's, there's a been discussion about how our building is too dense for this particular lot. And I just have to reference the building that they currently live in, which is actually taller and more voluminous. Thank you. Any questions for the um, petitioners? Commissioner Macy. <clears throat> on, the, on the height of it, so the building next door has those little like towery things and then the yes. lower thing. So what, where? Okay, so the towers are the stair towers. And that stair tower on Washington is 50 feet tall. That is seven feet higher than our parapet, our roof on our building. And how tall, how high is that balcony? To the peaks of their roofs of the houses that sit on top is 60 feet tall. Wait. Oh, I see. Any other questions? Commissioner Douglas? Well, so even so, it, as you've said, your um, the the height of the condos on this building is you just said 60, <coughs> 60 feet. Sixty feet to the ridge of the gable roofs. Right, mm -hmm. which I'm looking at right here. So even a building, I mean, if you look at the Chin Building, which is one story high, even a two story building would block the view of a a human being standing yep. on the patio of the adjacent building, right? The, their patios, their patios are currently, currently fall at our third floor line. And, and that third floor is something that we allow anyway. Yes, so, correct. so, you know, you're still lower than their building, but even a, a three-story building yes. would be blocking the view of somebody standing on their, their deck. That's correct. And I will also state that we designed this building like a U. We've created a light well that actually does not push our building completely against their building at four stories high. It only pushes it at technically the two stair towers. So it's pulled back 28 feet from their property, their south north property line to our south is 28 feet back is how ours is created. Right. Thank you. Any other questions for the petitioners? Sir, sir, that light's kind of glaring in my eyes. Do you mind, like, if you're going to record? All these meetings are on videotape, so it's a little distracting for me to concentrate on the topic at hand. Thank you. <laughs> uh, yeah, can I, I guess it would be legal for me to ask if you can. It is, yeah. Right now we're, okay, sir, last, sir, yeah. sir, sir, sir. There was a motion to allow them to speak, and so we had public comment before, and these are the petitioners of the building that actually haven't presented in front of this body, only planning, and so it was requested by the commissioner, but thank you. And also, I'd like to also uh, make a correction. We were in front, of, in front of planning commission twice for preliminary and then final PUD approval, not once. Any other questions? Commissioner Dubuck? Uh, uh, the density was raised as, uh, but you're, you have smaller units and that's to get to a particular price point. Is that accurate? That's you, correct. What is the target price point on these apartments? Well, again, we have quite a range of size of units. So our two bedrooms are about a thousand square feet. The one bedrooms range from seven to set to 800 square feet. And then the studios are 515. So they're technically not the micro units that Amber has at 350 square feet. Mm -hmm. So we didn't jam, in our opinion, we didn't jam a million units in there. We actually made units that we felt were rentable to young professionals in a location that is walkable to downtown. It's our plan regarding the price point to be under $200 per square foot. Gotcha. Thanks. Mr. Macy? Um, so one of the variances is about the landscaping. Like, it's not enough of the percentage of the square footage. I wonder if you could talk a little bit about that. That was one of my concerns. Well, one of the changes we made when we went from preliminary to final through the Planning Commission was we actually reduced the footprint of the building. So the first floor footprint was reduced 
to allow us to get closer to that landscape percentage. Did we get there? No, we didn't. But we got a lot closer by pulling the building in. As well as we pulled the balconies in and we pulled the whole footprint of that second floor in as well. So we did reduce the size of the building based on comments from the Planning Commission. Any other questions? Not seeing any. Thank you, gentlemen. Thank you. Commissioner Douglas? Yeah, I'm going to move approval of the uh, planned unit development as submitted and as uh, in the form voted on in, at our last meeting. Motion by Commissioner Douglas. Is there a second? Second by Sorry. Commissioner Dubuck. Okay, discussion, uh, Commissioner Douglas. Yes, if you uh, watch or attend the Planning Commission tomorrow, you will see a discussion of changes to the city's zoning ordinance for multifamily. Our multifamily size standards are very much out of date and not in sync with contemporary demand. As the target market analysis points out, as the gentleman correctly referred to, the audience, the market for Royal Oak and for products in Royal Oak is, as he has said, young professionals. They are very interested in walkable communities. They're not interested in owning two cars. Um, and this is exactly the kind of unit that will appeal to that market. Um, so what we are looking at in terms of our zoning ordinance is changing it to reduce the, the zone, the size of uh, buildings and setbacks and make some changes so that we as a city commission aren't up here approving planned unit developments for apartment buildings, which is not why that category was ever correct created. So what we're looking forward to is changing those standards so that um, developers can come to us with a plan that meets our zoning standards and the planning commission isn't having to rule on it. They're not having to invent a planned unit development in order to make it work. Um, and, and this development is consistent with what we're looking at going forward in the future. Commissioner Dubuck. <clears throat> So I raised at the last meeting that, uh, you know, one, we have been doing a lot of, uh, you know, variances, which Commissioner Douglas has raised multiple times, that uh, a lot of our code <coughs> is out of sync with, with market demand and, and uh, what, what people want and what the city needs. Um, I made the point that in addition to updating, updating our zoning, we need to um, identify for, for future requests where uh, folks are looking for a subsidy or a variety of variances or... Um, uh, anything that the city has to grant that you know we we get some uh, public benefit beyond the intrinsic value of the project and I think there's value in this project and we gave direction on, on draft from that last time what, what I've heard uh, you know from uh, about this project is you know, if there's the greener if there's a 20% runoff reduction uh, water runoff reduction which right now my understanding is everything that hits that parking lot which has no um, detention everything's running in directly into our sewers so it reduces that by 20 percent and there's also a variety of housing units at different sizes and price points to meet some of the needs that we've identified in our, our study um, both of those things seem to hit on a couple of, of priorities uh, and needs for us as a community I'm super sympathetic to the residents that came out who you know didn't know that Shin was going to you know, sell and, and need to maximize the value of their property, that they were going to their close. And, and I think that's really unfortunate. The question is, you know, there was people that came out when, when the building there was built and for one reason or another did not want that building built. And the city, the city commission at that time um, decided to go forward with that building and they get to live in that really nice building uh, in downtown now. And I, I struggle with the argument that, you know, that should be the last and tallest building in Royal Oak. Um, this site seems proper for it. There's already a block there of buildings that are even taller than this building. It meets multiple community needs. I, it's received strong support from planning with multiple changes to make it better suit the property. I, I can't find a reason to say no, even though I'm very, like I said, I, 
I totally understand the struggle of the residents that are living there, and they prefer not something not to be built there. But as Commissioner Douglas points out, something that is meets our code would still block the view from that porch. And, and so there's there's really no preventing that. Um, and I, I think that's that's really unfortunate, but um, not a reason to not move forward with something that I think would be a value add uh, to the community. Mr. Levasseur. I'm, I'm not going. I'm not going to support this motion. I believe this development is just too tall, uh, too dense for the neighborhood. Doesn't show appropriate respect for the folks that are already living there. Any other discussion, Commissioner Macy? Um, so I should have asked them about the too dense because uh, I was surprised to hear them say that actually the building next door is in fact more dense. Um, I wonder more if somebody volume. say it again. More voluminous. I mean, there's more square feet. Oh, I thought they said it was denser. I thought so, too. Mm. Okay. Otherwise, it's not, doesn't, Maybe it's not really a good counter-argument if it's just that it's larger, like... Oh. We'll get that clarification real quick. Excuse me, sir. Excuse me. The chair has privilege here. You're out of order. Yes, I'll uh, respond to that. So what I meant by the fact that it's denser, it's not that there's 48 units there. What I meant is it fits the complete footprint of lot line to lot line. That's what oh, I meant. Okay. So what I meant by volume was, is I meant they don't have a line of landscaping on the front of there. They don't have lines of landscaping on the sides of their building. There's zero lot line to zero lot line. At a tune of, I believe it's, almost double the size of ours. It's a massive structure. Did that answer your question? Yes, it, it, it did. Um, although it's, it sort of brings me back to being confused about this. After the last meeting, I was thinking more about what Commissioner Dubuck was talking about last time, um, about whether or not these, these PUDs that come in front of us that are pretty dense and, um, you know, fill up the lot pretty well, which I, I understand now is not is to the same degree as the one next door, although the density seems <coughs> higher, and that are taller than we would otherwise allow all those things together. Like, is it, what, is it, the, is it bringing the right benefit to this neighborhood? Is this, is this the right fit? Um, and I've been spending a lot of time thinking about it, and I was sort of hoping there would be a more robust debate up here so I could think more about it. Um, because I looked, I looked down there, and thinking I was trying to eyeball 43 feet which is not all that easy and um, thinking about the the density compared to what's around there and there are some places where I think this would be a perfect fit and I, I wasn't sure that it was quite the right fit for this it does seem it does seem a little dense um, but again it's a little it's a hard thing to eyeball when you're walking around a, an empty parking lot um, and now I feel concerned that it's possible that some people didn't get notice who wanted to have a chance to talk about this at the Planning Commission. So I don't know. I'm, I'm waffling around. That's where I am. Commissioner Douglas. I'd like to understand Commissioner Levasseur's density argument. Are you talking about the, uh, the lot line to lot line density as the architect has explained, or are you talking about the number of occupants of the, the number of units? We're talking about the number of people here. I mean, we can talk about the volume, but the question is how many people are you fitting in that volume? And there's no question there's a lot more people in this per, per, uh, parcel compared to the neighboring condos. Right. The neighboring condos are, what, seven large units, so the number of people living there is less. But, Anna, is there some sort of citywide or objective density scale or number of occupants per square foot that you're shooting for? Well, I, I don't know that I can answer that question, but you, you, you look at parking and the impact that... Uh, uh, density has on parking and the overflow into the neighborhoods and that's a concern that you have to have so that's your objection is the the it has inadequate parking is that what I mean, you're that's, saying that's part of it I mean it's, it's just too large for the area it's going to have an adverse impact on the neighbors that's my concern okay thanks Commissioner Dubuck yeah I, I appreciate that argument I feel that concern actually 
Um, what I struggle with is that I think we've recognized that we need uh, you know, greater diversification of our housing stock. And if we're going to rely on folks to build the kind of uh, uh, housing uh, options that we know that we need, then they have to do so in a way that is, is profitable. Unless we want to subsidize it, and there's been no conversation about subsidizing, uh, you know, residential development uh, in the city in a long time because we, we haven't had to. Um, so if we want smaller units at lower price points, then you have to put more in the building in, in order, uh, I think, for it to make financial sense. This is I'm not a financial wizard by any means, but that 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 makes sense to me. So we've said we want this thing. And this is what it takes to deliver it. So either, either, we, either we want uh, a variety of housing styles and options uh, for people at different price points, at different income levels, at different points in their life, or, or we don't, or are we just saying that this is not the right place for that thing that we clearly want? Commissioner Parrish. These same arguments have been articulated for years. Um, dealing with different types of apartments, dealing with different types of residential developments, dealing with different types of condos versus apartments versus single family homes. I remember when um, the Barton Towers project was first proposed, which butts right up against a neighborhood, uh, a great deal of concern about the density of that development, a great deal of concern about inadequate parking, because certainly um, the number of parking spaces there um, do not jive with a number of apartments that are in that building, um, but it, it was determined appropriately and calculated appropriately because not all the seniors in that facility have a car. Um, this is the same type of calculation. The developers have said and the plan commission have said that this specific population target that the housing study targeted, which is young professionals, they don't have, those are not families with two cars. Um, typically, they typically have one car if they have any car at all. A lot of them don't have cars, period. So that's why the Plan Commission, I think, co was comfortable with uh, approving this with a number of parking spaces that we had, given the density in the building. Um, the, uh, the other senior housing unit in our city, which is older, Royal Oak Manor, also is within a, in the middle of a neighborhood. Um, doesn't quite <laughs> conform to the other character of the houses next door to it in the neighborhood. Um, height disparity is huge. It's multiple stories versus a one-story house right out the back door, a number of houses right out the back door. Um, and they seem to be get along uh, fairly well. And there again, um, there's a parking shortage, um, but even with adding parking to adequately provide for parking for the, for the seniors that have cars, um, there's a number of seniors there that don't have cars and never will, and so the parking was was scaled down. Um, so I think that I think that the the, the way that this plan commission at, at, or, or approached the parking issue is appropriate, given the target market for who is going to be renting these apartments. You're not going to have couples who are then going to have children moving into 800 square foot apartments. That's just not going to happen. And given the price point that we are looking at you're not going to have um, necessarily higher income individuals, middle class income individuals. They're not going to be looking for apartments like this. Um, we're targeting a market with lower cost apartments because there aren't a whole lot of lower cost apartments in Royal Oak. If you have families or small in, uh, groups of families, one child or just an adult, uh, it is <laughs> extraordinarily difficult to find affordable housing in this community. Of incredibly difficult to find affordable housing. And this is one answer to it. Um, I was on the fence about this project for a long time because I also was concerned about the density. Um, but I was persuaded by the developer's discussion this evening about how this compares to the building next door. It is This <coughs> building is not lot line to lot line like the building next door. Um, it is shorter than the building next door. And no matter what goes on this property, and we're not going to prevent anything from going on this property, we are not going to keep chin jewelry there or a retail store there. It is going to be developed into something. And if even if you just apply the existing zoning ordinance, it's going to be at least a three-story building, and that's going to block as many units in that, in that uh, apartment or that condo building next door practically as this one does. 
So I think the density argument was effectively handled by the, the developers tonight in terms of demonstrating that if you've got the condo development next door and the density and the size of the footprint, this isn't a whole lot different. And in fact, it's smaller. It's much more closer together. Um, the other concern that I had also was their ability to handle stormwater runoff. That was a question that one of the residential neighbors brought up um, a couple of weeks ago when we had this in front of us. Um, but they've made some significant commitments to build a rain garden on the roof to capture a significant amount of, of stormwater runoff from the building. I still think that they also have some stormwater retention issues that it's going to be complicated for them to meet, um, and they're going to have to meet under the city ordinances. Um, so that you don't have runoff into the neighborhood, that's existing, um, and that hasn't been modified at all by the, by the planned unit development that's been proposed. Um, so I was glad to see that they are making some additional concessions for stormwater runoff by the design of the, of the roof. Um, the other thing that had occurred to me is there are an awful lot of new single-family homes in this community that are being built, and you all are aware of them. Um, if you were to put one or two or three of those single family homes on this lot as opposed to this condo development, their height would be greater than this building based on the designs that I've seen. People are building enormous single family homes in this community and they would be permitted without any zoning variances whatsoever. And they would be taller than this building because that's how they're being designed and built if you look anywhere in the community. So you just the fact that the height of the building should disqualify it i don't think is is reasonable based upon the fact that we've we broke that glass ceiling about building height a long time ago if we didn't want to have tall buildings in our commercial areas along main street or washington or in the downtown we should never have permitted the fifth and lafayette we should never have permitted barton towers we should never have permitted the royal oak manor those are 12-story buildings, and they're right up against a residential neighborhood. So we've been there, and we've done that. We have broken through that glass ceiling 30 years ago. So we've beyond the point where we can argue, oh, we shouldn't have tall buildings. We are way, way beyond that. So after going back and forth and back and forth and back and forth about concerns about density and concerns about the, the types of housing that this actually provides to the community, I'm going to vote yes, because I think it's going to be a good development. I think it is going to be an asset to the community. I think it's going to provide affordable housing to a community that is underserved in our community. And I think that the Plan Commission did a decent job in terms of identifying those types of variances which were appropriate in order to make this happen. Um, so that's why I'm going to vote yes. Any other discussion? Commissioner Dubuck. Uh, yeah, I'm just, uh, this might be for the uh, city attorney. Uh, given that the you know, developer has mentioned that they're working diligently on getting that green roof uh, built as a part of this development, is there a way to formalize that commitment as a part of the motion before us right now? I'm not sure if that requirement is actually reflected in the plans or in the development agreement that's in front of the commission or not. So um, You can make an am amendment to your original motion that it's contingent upon the execution of that feature. Yeah. So I'll move to, uh, to amend the uh, motion uh, <coughs> that this uh, final approval is pending, uh, the incorporation of that green roof feature into the final design. Well, we have a motion by Commissioner Dubuck. I see a hand up. Commissioner Douglas? Second. Discussion? All right, I'll call for the vote. All those in favor say aye. 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 Right, now that brings us back to the original motion, which has been amended to ensure that that feature will be included in the construction if the motion at hand right now passes. Okay, everyone understand? Okay. Discussion. Anybody else? I'll just add that, you know, I'm very grateful that we had some neighbors come out tonight and express their concerns about a building that is going up adjacent to their property. Um, your concerns are heard. Um, you know, certainly from a notification perspective, you know, we do this all the time. This is what we do. I take the word of the city planner that notifications went out. Um, if for whatever reason you didn't get one, um, you know, at this point, um, we have to rely on our planning director uh, as far as, um, you know, how that process is, uh, is represented and how it, how it unfolds. Um, a lot of talk about 
you know, the PUD and, and things of that nature. I'll say that, you know, just being around for a long time here, um, I've witnessed, you know, at this table since 2011, a lot of different changes in the community. Um, you know, in that period, we've seen over a quarter billion dollars in five years investment in our neighborhoods, over 100 permits pulled a year for single family homes. These are the, some of the, the homes that are now housing families. Um, you know, people are raising their children here. Uh, our schools are doing tremendously well. Um, so, you know, we've in the past have tackled and set objectives and goals to make sure that our community is vibrant, not just, you know, for one demographic or another. Uh, we focused on senior activities. We're, we're, we got a um, target market analysis to understand what we need to do for everybody in our community. What sort of housing stock do we need to make sure that not just families, which are flourishing in our neighborhoods, can stay here and, 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 and thrive, uh, but people of all ages. And um, there's a need in our community for both additional senior housing and for housing that, you know, people that work and live in our downtown or people that work in our downtown and, and serve us coffee at Starbucks or, you know, may not be on the higher end of the income spectrum and certainly may not be able to afford their point in life where they're not able to afford a $500,000 new home build or a $300,000 existing bungalow, but there's options for so them to call Royal Oak home as well. And okay. this certainly meets that need. I think from a practical perspective, my heart goes out to the folks that you know bought ahead of you. Um, but the way the property is zoned right now, that doesn't change. You know, We could have a Taco Bell go in there, you know, which honestly would be a heck of a lot more impactful to the neighborhood than going from commercial to residential. There's not a planner in this world that will tell you that residential has more of an impact on a neighborhood than commercial activity. Um, so, you know, part of the zoning change moving from commercial to residential, um, you know, in my opinion, de-risks the concerns about congestion and traffic and things like that. Um, so, you know, it, it's, there's things that we have control over and certainly if we you know, the property, if there are no zoning requests whatsoever, as Commissioner Perush appropriately pointed out, three-story building could be there. Um, we could have single-family homes that have high peaks. Uh, we could have fast food establishments there. Um, there are things that, um, you know, multitude of things that could go there. And, and moving to a project that is residential in nature, that abuts to a neighborhood, that limits um, traffic, that limits um, and helps you know blend our neighborhoods into our commercial district, which is more downtown proper, uh, does meet the needs. It doesn't mean we're unempathetic to you know everybody in this process, but we have to consider um, the entire city as a whole. And um, you know, votes aren't don't come easy, and they're not uh, always uh, so simple. But I think when you look at you know the overall objectives of um, what we're trying to do as a community, the benefits that it will bring to the neighborhood, um, the ability for us to, you know, move forward with making sure that our community can remain home to everybody of every age and income level. Um, you know, these type of projects are going to be important. If it's not at this location, it's somewhere else. And, you know, there will always be concerns with adjoining neighbors. So, um, you know, I, I'm going to be supporting it. You know, I thought hard and long over it at planning. Um, and. Uh, I think it's the appropriate project, but it should go, we should say and should be recognized that, you know, we're empathetic to the adjoining neighbors and some of the concerns. Uh, but, you know, things have to be weighed and decisions have to be made. Any other discussion? All right, with none, I'll call for the vote. All those in favor say aye. 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 Those opposed? Nay. Nay. The motion passes. All right, that brings us to item number 10, the future sidewalk improvement program recommendation. Good evening, Mayor and Commissioners. Um, first of all, I'll say this has been a long time in the works. Uh, this report that we put together um, started last winter, and uh, you may remember that in January this past year, uh, we went over some of these ideas and promise to bring back a larger report with some more investigation. So uh, this is the summary of what we worked on since uh, January. Um, uh, I worked on this report with the city manager who is no longer around, but um, he helped me uh, 
to get this into a two-page document with a lot of attachments. I hope you've had a chance to read some of them, and I'm here to answer your questions. But essentially, we want to evaluate our program of sidewalk replacements, um, which we've talked in depth about, about running a continuous program. And with that in mind, we looked at some alternatives. Well, actually, we looked at the types of defects that we were seeing and kind of categorized, categorized them into three categories. We have our trip hazard defects, which is the ones that can uh, someone can uh, trip over. Um, we have the structural defects, which are broken sidewalks. Uh, they've been driven over by cars or for some reason they've been cracked. Um, under their own weight or for some other weight. And then we've looked at some other surface condition type issues which aren't structural, but they do have a tendency to um, cause a sidewalk to fail over time. So we looked at each one of those categories and, and determined that we could potentially make the sidewalk program at lower cost. Um, we could uh, look at some, we looked at the level of defects and their hazard level to determine if there's some sort of uh, uh, lesser repair option that could that could make these sidewalks last longer, such as shaving or filling pits like we had allowed in the last sidewalk program. Um, the longevity of the repairs that we we're making, we see a lot of sidewalks that are still um, moving around due to trees and other uh, <coughs> rates being placed on them or, or, or settlements. Um, and we wanted to simplify this because it seemed like a lot of people didn't understand it very well. And uh, uh, But we want to make sure that whatever we do, we want those um, repairs to last a long time. And th that's the biggest problem. People uh, aren't seeing their sidewalks last as long as we'd like to see them. So um, we came up with some we had a lot of discussion about this, Don and I did, and we came up with some recommended ideas that are in a resolution for you, and you don't have to vote on this tonight if you don't want to. You do want to. Um, but uh, we would need an answer soon, because we, if we want to do a program next year, we need to get out and, and resurvey those sidewalks. We haven't done it in over a year. So um, we're recommending that we uh, raise our standard for a trip from a half an inch to an inch. Um, the, there's some discussion in here about the, the laws changing that um, limit our liability to a two inch differential. So in the past, our half inch differential was a pretty tight standard and it, a lot of people disagreed with it. So um, that was the first recommendation. We talked about some of the cracked sidewalks and there's some cracked sidewalks we could probably leave in place. They'll probably last for six years. They're, they have a tight defined crack and they're not broken into more than uh, two pieces. Um, and then we had some other uh, defect criteria that we did not change um, from the last sidewalk program. We felt that some of those things were still pretty standard and would be reason to replace a sidewalk or allow a property owner to patch some pits. Um, one of the ideas with the grinding off a lipped edge is that we looked into the cost of that and how we would run that type of program. We determined we couldn't effectively do that at a reasonable cost to the homeowner. But we could allow a property owner, if they wanted to go that route, to save themselves some money of replacement to grind that off with a professional company. And we try to write them up a minimal permit to do a review of that. And, and it would probably cost them about half the cost of a, a normal sidewalk replacement. Um, so there's some recommendations here on the second page. A lot of attachments, and I'm happy to answer your questions. <coughs> questions for Mr. Callahan. Uh, when you say nominal permit fee, what do you have in mind for that? Something like $25. Okay. Normally, and our permit starts at $130. Okay, and, and in exchange for that $25, is there a service that the city is going to be providing? Yes. And what, what would that be? We come out to make sure that it's as smooth as one of these pictures. So we would have some guidelines for them to follow that says your finished product should look like this. And these companies that do this um, concrete grinding, that's their finished product in, in the pictures like I showed. Um, they do a professional job. Um, it, it's a type of equipment that you just can't go rent at Buttons or Chet's over in Berkeley and do it yourself. It's a very heavy-duty piece of equipment that, is, um, that a homeowner wouldn't be able to do. 
and, and if they can't achieve the final product, uh, a nice smooth surface that's even all the way across, then, then we would have to do something else with that sidewalk. Okay, now, now going through the list of <clears throat> the different kinds of defects, I want to get a, a sense of the, uh, uh, how many of these items are uh, safety issues, such as the uh, one inch differential versus whether uh, some of them are more aesthetic or more a concern that they may become safety issues. So like, for example, we're talking about uh, we're talking about scaling, we're talking about uh, pinning, things like that. I want to get a sense of whether those are truly uh, safety issues or if, if you're just anticipating that it could lead to a safety issue or, or what the reasoning behind that is. Some of those surface issues, such as scaling and um, uh, surface deteriorations, when that smooth, broomed finish comes off of the sidewalk because the surface has peeled away. Um, water can't drain effectively off of it, so you can have water ponding on the surface there. And in the wintertime, water ponding can freeze, and now we have an icing issue. And the water sitting on that doesn't help its longevity. You know, the water is probably the, one of the biggest causes of the failures of any sort of pavement that we have. It gets into the cracks, it freezes and expands, and causes the crack to, to widen and... and that leads to the failure of the pavement. So any type of issue that could cause water to not drain properly off of it, which is primarily those surface things, pitting, these large pits can hold a good amount of water, and the pits don't get any smaller on their own. They only get larger. So the water is exasperating those uh, defects. Um, Mr. Macy. Yeah. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> I want to say first of all how happy I am to see this. I know I know you didn't want to do this, and I could I could tell when I read it that you were like, this is not the safest thing to do as an engineer. I have to tell you, and you told us over and over again in the documents, this is not the safe thing. But I know you goofs at the commission want to do it, so here's what I recommend, and I appreciate that you came up with these recommendations that I think will save a lot of money on the sidewalk program, and I don't think are going to compromise safety very much at all. Um, I just wanted to clarify, so the pitted sidewalks, that's one thing that the, that the homeowner can fix themselves. That is correct, right. currently, yes. And that's, do they need a permit for that? No. Okay, and is there anything you, that uh, homeowners can do about scaling or not? Not really, no. Okay, so that. But it has, and it, like in here, it has to be excessive. You know, if, if it's a small area and a corner of a slab that's not going to cause us to look at it and say, this is totally defective and needs to be replaced. Okay. And I noticed you took pooling out of the list, right? And in, in, frankly, in the other sidewalk programs, we would rarely get a homeowner come to us and say, my sidewalk always ponds water, will you replace it for me? Um, one or two people per sidewalk year would ask us to do something about ponding. And it really, we can't tell that when we're out. We can't tell that there's a problem with ponding on a sidewalk when we're out doing our surveys. We're going out and during the work day, it's usually dry, and the ponding isn't there. Um, it usually happens at the end of the program when somebody says we've replaced a sidewalk within the area where ponding water occurred to them, and they notice this new sidewalk and notice the ponding, and they may not have noticed before. So we didn't feel it was worth our time to include that because we weren't really doing anything with those We'll, we'll certainly, if somebody came to us and said, hey, my sidewalk floods all the time and it's always underwater, what can I do to fix it? We'll work with that property owner to come up with a solution. Um, but okay. we're not going to make it a, a criteria that we're going to go look at when okay. we're doing our surveys and running this program. Um, uh, so you mentioned that with the, the shaving that the homeowner is going to be responsible for finding someone, but I thought I said it saw in there that you might provide a list of the city. Absolutely, and there's uh, neighboring communities who do allow that in their, in their cities, and they do provide a list of, I don't want to say vetted contractors, but reputable companies that they can call and get a price. Um, so it read like you were recommending this only if we were going to have a continuous sidewalk program, but the resolution is for a new side six-year sidewalk program am i correct and that you're thinking we're just going to keep renewing that in order to make these yeah at work? the end of every six years you know someone the next city engineer will come forward and the next time and say you know we're at the, oh, we're coming to problem, the end of the program would you like to run another one starting next year to keep this continuous program running okay and also you had mentioned something about 
there's a lot of dissatisfaction with the sidewalk program going backwards and a lot of misunderstanding about how it works and what the criteria are. And you said one thing that would be great would be to, to do a better job of communicating that to residents. I wonder if you had any ideas on that front. No, that's our job. We already send a very informative letter, which Judy Davids was helpful for us to shrink and and make a little bit more simple to understand. But we created a, a several pages of our city website with all the information that used to be in the letter, and it's all very laid out, and there's pictures and the background, and um, uh, more and more people, uh, you know, remember the first sidewalk program, I don't know if anybody was here then, but it started in 1995 and went through 2006, and then we did another one starting in 2011 and went through 2017. So there's a continuous turnover of homeowners through the community. Um, the advent of the internet has helped us out greatly with providing information to people, um, and they can look it up on their own, but they still call. There's still people that call us and they want explanations, and I've got great clerks who are uh, helping them over the telephone, and you know, if there's any other information that we can send to them, we'd be happy to do that. But uh, um, we put things in the Insight magazine, and and uh, we try to use all the avenues to reach out to people um, to give them information. But you know, like like anything, like this report, it's a long report, and nobody wants to read it. Um, no, no, I think that's it. Commissioner Gibbs. Um. I live right next to Berkeley, and I have a new appreciation for our sidewalk program because Berkeley does not have such a strict requirement for their sidewalks, and I'm sorry to any Berkeley residents who might hear this. Um, I did trip. I didn't fall, but I tripped over a two-inch lift in, um, in, in, the, in the sidewalk. <clears throat> for whatever reason, I was too embarrassed I just kept walking. <laughs> I didn't want to stop and try and figure out what was going on, but there was a lift. Um, so I, I do have a new appreciation for our sidewalk program. I think these requirements are going to be much better for the residents and the homeowners to um, keep up the repairs and offering the residents the ability to fill in the pits and you know shave will should certainly appease the majority of them. So I'm in favor of this. Commissioner Perush, I think I saw your hand or no? I, I did. It, my comments um, pretty much echo Commissioner Gibbs's as well. Um, over the last year after this uh, earlier sidewalk program ended, I just took a look periodically at what other communities are doing um, and, and just noticed that uh, in looking at the detail that other communities set up, it's very, very, very similar, not only to what we had in place, but also to these tweaks that we're doing with this particular program if we opt to um, institute it. Um, it, it, it. It really is, I mean, it, financially, it's, uh, it's another issue that you have to add into your budget if it happens to be um, your neighborhood year to do the sidewalk improvements and you do have a couple of slabs that you have to repair or replace or whatever. Um, and it's it's not inexpensive. The cost of concrete keeps going up. Um, the cost of labor to install concrete keeps going up uh, just because of all the building that is going on in the metro area. Um, and that's going to happen when we institute this program next year as well. So uh, that's an unfortunate aspect of that. But as Commissioner Gibbs said, when you don't do it, you run into uh, people who have accidents, and it's not just the liability that we're concerned about, the dollars that we would have to pay out in insurance claims. It's, 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 a, it's a public health issue. Mm -hmm. We don't want people falling and breaking arms. Um, I tripped on my own sidewalk a number of years ago, not my own sidewalk, my own driveway a number of years ago. Um, fell, split my lip, had stitches, looked like a hockey player for like six weeks because it was like this. But you have to you have to maintain this because if you don't, there will be accidents and people will end up in the hospital in casts or stitches or whatever, and we don't want that to happen. So I think this is an issue that we have to pay attention to. As a community, we have a responsibility to maintain these things. We all have to bite the bullet and pay for the expense when it comes time to be our turn. Um, and I think that these tweaks that they've put into the program this year make a great deal of sense. It will give the residents an opportunity to do an awful lot of self-help. They'll have an opportunity to make some uh, repairs on their own. 
uh, especially the ability to fill in pits with the magic concrete replacement stuff that you can buy at Friends Hardware or anywhere else, um, is very helpful. So I think these are good, uh, these are good changes. Um, I think we need to keep the program going um, because it's a safety issue, and uh, I appreciate all the time that the staff has put into this um, because it's a, it's a complicated subject. <clears throat> Mr. Callahan, I did have a question. I know we kind of touched upon this before, and I really appreciate the approach here because I think it's worth a shot. It, it's worth a try. Um, we don't get better unless we, you know, push the envelope a little bit, and, and we're always looking for value. There's perfection, and then there's cost, and somehow we're going to find that right balance. It's clear that we need to have a sidewalk program. I mean, anyone that lives in our neighborhoods or anywhere else, I mean, we're a very walkable community. Um, it's hard not to see on a nice summer day you know, hundreds of people not on our sidewalks, and we want to make sure they're safe, um, including the neighbors in front of my house, even though that might have to cost me a little bit of money from time to time. Um, so the question I have is, is when we talk about, you know, the natural effects, we talk about trees uprooting, um, concrete, and some of the other water conditions, um, but another part is actually the quality of installation <clears throat> of the sidewalks, the quality of the contractor, are they meeting our specifications, warranty issues, you know, and is there a plan or do we in a way keep track of, okay, you know, this contractor installed this sidewalk and, you know, five years later, four years later, six years later, uh, one year later, um, you know, these type of things are popping up. Uh, and some of it can be explained away as natural variation, but if, are there patterns or are there issues? Because uh, part of, the, I think, solving the issue is, is not to have, you know, problems at all, right? And so, I mean, I'd have to, I would be remiss if I didn't think that contractors have a role in that. So what are we doing exactly to make sure that we have the, the best quality contractors uh, installing our sidewalks in the community? Well, unfortunately, there's not many contractors out there that do this type of work anymore. Um, like you said, like people said, their contractors are very busy all across the metro region and there's a very uh, limited number of people who will bid on a project like this, even, even when it's more than a million dollars worth of sidewalk work. Um, there's some things we're looking into about our concrete mixes that we, we may tweak. Um, sidewalks are different than roads, you know, there's, with the natural variation, uh, we use typically concrete mixes that are spec'd out by MDOT. They build freeways. Uh, if the little chip pops out of the freeway, that just adds more traction for tires, but it's not really great for sidewalks, and some of that materials go into reasons why that sort of thing happens. Um, our contractors have to um, meet the requirements of the contract. They have to have insurance. They have to be able to post bonds. They're obligated to fix things that don't last in the first year. Uh, and if they don't get to it the first year, they'll be doing it whenever it, they come back to get it. And then it's guaranteed for another year. Um, we don't have longer periods of uh, warranty than that. If we were to make warranties longer time periods, then the cost will go up because a contractor has to build in the cost of having to come back five years after the concrete is placed, and, and that costs money. And he's, it's buying insurance, essentially, for himself. Um, but in your so, opinion, does a year usually weed out faulty installation? Absolutely. Once in a while, you know, with just this past sidewalk program, with some of the scaling that we saw in the major roads, and people were very uh, concerned that they had gotten their sidewalk bill, but their sidewalk didn't look really great after the first winter. Um, the contractor eventually came back and replaced all of those at his own dime. It didn't cost the city or the homeowner any additional money. Um, but yeah, there's the time per period. And <laughs> you know, it doesn't look really great on us to have that poorly looking concrete sitting out there um, for as long as it did. Um, it makes us look like we did a bad job. But the, the amount of work that he had to come back and redo was a very small fraction of less than 1% of all the sidewalk that he did in that year. So. Um, and he had to come back this summer and do some of those again because the heat caused some of these sidewalks to expand and buckle. You know, so there's all sorts of things, you know, and I tried to keep it as least technical as possible, this report. There's a lot of things that go into construction that affect um, the longevity of what you're building. And, and um, but you're writing we know specifications what those are. and requiring the warranty to establish that longevity. And you feel confident what you have when you send out the, the bids that 
you know, a one-year warranty, the, the mix that we're requiring and things like that, um, you know, bad workmanship will weed itself out in a 12-month period, four-season period. You know, we get very consistent workmanship from the contractor across all parts of the city when we hire somebody. Um, we see little bad workmanship, okay. per se. Um, the concrete is tested in accordance with our standards and with nationally recognized standards um, before it's even placed in the in the uh, forms. Um, so we're, we're pretty confident that, you know, I think people are just very particular. They understand they're paying something. The, the price isn't $80 a flag anymore like it was in the 90s. It's 130 to $150. Yeah. So it can add up pretty quickly, and they're very concerned that they're getting their money's worth, and I totally understand that. Yeah, they don't um, want to be back six years paying another $1,000 because, you know, the flags failed. Correct. Okay. Did I answer your question? It did. Okay. Any other questions for Mr. Callahan? Commissioner Macy? I'll move approval to resolutions. A motion by Commissioner Macy. Is there a second? Second by Commissioner Dubuck. Discussion? I already gave my random so, so oh, pleased to see this. Um, this has been something that's been a thorn in the side of our residents, and I don't know that it's going to be totally removed, but it's a slightly smaller thorn, and I appreciate your hard work to make that happen. Uh, you've demonstrated quite a lot of work and a lot of thought into it, and I love to see this kind of report that um, really goes through it all and explains exactly what your thought process was, what the pros and cons are, and then comes up with a really, um, from this large report, this really coherent and beautifully written resolution. Uh, if anyone is curious about the sidewalk program and where we're going from here and where we've been, there's some good reading right here. Thank you. You're welcome. Mr. Dubuck. Good reading. <laughs> uh, I was just echoing those comments. This has been kind of a long evolution for us, and I really appreciate uh, Mr. Callahan relenting from his rigid <laughs> engineering <laughs> tendencies <laughs> uh, to allow... Uh, you know, for the potential for some relief to residents and what is a very necessary but, you know, tedious and inconvenient <coughs> process for all of us. So thank you. Any other discussion? All right. I'll call for the vote. All those in favor say aye. 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 Those opposed? Motion passes. Thank you, Mr. Callahan. You're welcome. Next is our uh, item number 11, which is the... Um, Downtown Development Authority recommendation on free handicap parking. I sense Mr. Uh, you may me. You may recall that uh, at your June 24th meeting, uh, the DDA had forwarded a recommendation regarding adding uh, handicap spaces to on-street locations in the downtown, um, primarily at angle spots, but also at some of the 90-degree uh, uh, spaces uh, along the deck. Um, as part of that discussion, the, the City Commission referred a uh, uh, question back to the uh, DDA in its role as parking committee, asking the DDA to uh, give you a recommendation on whether or not those handicap spaces should be uh, charged or whether they should be free. Uh, as you'll see in the, uh, your commission packet, the DDA's committee uh, that looks at uh, a lot of the infrastructure items um, looked at it at a meeting, and then the DDA discussed it at their full board meeting. And they forwarded a recommendation to you that uh, indicates that uh, the recommended city commission do charge established rates for those uh, on-street spaces that are being added uh, to the handicap uh, spaces. They are primarily existing spaces, uh, and the majority of them also have meters uh, at them currently or they have some sort of kiosk a payment system uh, along center or will have it along the alley. Uh, so the DDA is recommending that those on-street spots uh, continue to be charged for at the established rates. Uh, and then they further went and said any of the other existing configurations, meaning the parking decks and the surface lot continue uh, under their current format because they really didn't look at those. Uh, they, they limited it to the on-street spaces in terms of the review. Commissioner Lavasser. Uh, one thing I didn't see in the materials was a discussion of the uh, financial impact on our parking fund if we were to choose to uh, uh, provide 
free parking in these instances. Was, was that something that the DDA they didn't really look at dollar amounts and uh, given that we were they were only looking at probably 19 spaces um, uh, in total uh, that we were talking about uh, they didn't really get into the financial end of it do we have some sense of the numbers I don't have well, I mean if we could presume that if they're what what's the percentage of the spaces downtown like well again we're Some of them are on 7th Street in front of OCC, which may, OCC's got a lot of their own handicapped spaces, so these may not get used or, or they may not generate a, a lot of revenue currently. Right. And depending on the location, I think that would vary. Um, so I don't, I don't have a number. No, but I mean, I think of the overall of no percentage of parking, street-level parking spaces in the downtown. It's pretty small. Yeah, you're like 5%. Then yeah, I believe so. Last report from uh, your prior meeting on the 24th, <coughs> we indicated it was less than it's about three percent. Yeah, over the requirement, but of but, the entire yeah. parking, which would be a one and a half percent of the entire parking system, if you assume, which is pretty close, that half the parking is street level and half of it's in parking garages. And then, depending on you know use, Commissioner Dubuque. So my instinct is the cost would be nominal. Uh, that's not really my concern at all. I don't think it's going to be a huge hit to the parking fund. My concern is that if we're going to enact policy um, under the premise that it's good for persons with disabilities or makes our city more accessible, that it should actually do that. And in reading about cities that have um, not charged uh, for uh, accessible parking spaces, first of all, most of them are retracting that because they found that the policies are not effective and better serving people with disabilities. Um, but it also adds to you know, like stigmatizing and kind of belittling people with disabilities is just because you have a disability doesn't mean you lack ability to pay. The, the state actually has um, a yellow tag program where you can qualify for that, and, and our, our parking enforcement respects that tag. And that tag, you can park anywhere in the city with that tag, not just at the accessible spots, and not have to feed them either. Um, so my primary concern is making sure that in, in this addition of more accessible street level parking that we're continuing to follow through and make sure that our city is as accessible, not just ADA compliant, but as accessible as we can possibly make it, equitable as we can possibly make it, um, you know, for people with disabilities, for our aging population. So my question is, did you all look into our payment systems? Are, are there ADA um, measures that we can enact with regard to our meters and our pay stations to make sure that those are as accessible as possible? Mm, the, when they looked at the on-street spaces previously, the, the recommendation was for the 19 was that if they had meters, uh, the current meters, that they'd be lowered um, to, to meet that standard. Um, no, I don't think we've really looked at the the other existing meters, if, if you're referring to somebody having a yellow sticker and lowering all meters, uh, but the ones that were going to become uh, marked for handicap uh, spaces, those part of that prior resolution was to uh, lower the meter heights. Okay. And, and, but have we looked at, are there ADA standards that dictate meter positioning? Do we need to ensure that people uh, you know, using mobility supports can access the payment side? Uh, you know, of the meter, that make sure I'm, there's proper clearance, 36 right. inches of clearance, that kind right. of thing? I haven't personally, but I'm sure our parking and people will look at that as part of that recommendation. Okay. As I, I'm of the mind, like, we've done this, and we need to make sure we're doing it right. Like, it's a nice sentiment to say we can make it free, but everything that you read up on the subject, it, it imply like, what cities have found is that it doesn't necessarily help. It can actually harm people with disabilities where if you allow for like free parking just with a placard, um, you increase incidents of fraud where now someone that doesn't really need the, the space but can actually get the placard is now tying up a, a spot indefinitely because uh, they don't have to pay, whereas the payment forces rotation on the spots. Um, secondly, even if it is folks who have a legitimate need, the purpose of our street parking is for easy in and easy out service. But again, if you don't have a payment structure, the purpose of which is to rotate people through, you can have someone occupying the immediately accessible space for a very long period of time thus rendering the spaces we've installed less effective and, and us less accessible. So, uh, again, the, the standards that other, other, other cities have tried this and seen that 
it was actually a net loss. It's not the money. That's, I think it's a nominal amount of money. That's not the issue. I just don't know that it's good policy from a disability rights, inclusivity, and accessibility perspective. Um, I, I want to make sure that we're, we're seeing well, this all the way through the best possible way. Two of the reasons that the committee and the DDA decided to recommend against it were abusive, the spots being free, and then a lot of the cities that they looked at and reviewed that had done free parking for these spaces are now reversing that stance for various reasons. So those are two of the items that they talked about. Well, and I noticed they also did recommend that we promote awareness of the yellow tag system right. so that people do actually have the need of that accommodation. You know, we let them know, one, that it's there, here's how you get it, and our parking enforcement will respect that yellow tag. And we can make sure that we are promoting that to our residents because that, that process already exists. And from my perspective, that's in the best interest of, of uh, you know, making our city more accessible for people with all kinds of uh, uh, disabilities, whether it be uh, you know, mobility or sensory disabilities. And if you had the yellow tag program, I would imagine that it's important to have, because you're not always going to get a spot during peak times, uh, you know, in any of the open uh, spots. So, you know, having that yellow tag, you know, which pro provides accommodation, um, you know, you also want to make sure that you have a handicapped spot available during peak times. And, you know, people that do have the yellow tag for whatever financial or, you know, ability reason, then at least have an option. Because I do think it's about a circulation question. Um, I, I had two thoughts on this. I think the first is, you know, um, I guess uh, I can't claim to, to be disabled, but I did have uh, surgery recently on my Achilles, um, had a big boot on. I qualified for a temporary, like, six-month uh, permit. Um, ironically, it was actually too hard to get to the Secretary of State <laughs> in my condition to drive and do all that, so I just uh, uh, didn't get the permit. But if I did, um, I would imagine that if it were free, and, you know, I'm not a person of great economic means, but I can certainly put money into the meter, that, you know, I could sit at that spot all day if I wanted to, five hours, six hours, ten hours, and have prime parking, and that would actually prohibit somebody else that also had an issue, either permanent or temporary, uh, to fill that spot and circulate. So if I happened to work downtown, uh, I could sit there all day and, and not get the circulation. Um, the other thing, too, is realizing, though, with this uh, condition I had for a couple months that, um, you know, it's really hard to get around. And I could imagine that, um, you know, walking to the downtowns out of the question, um, making it a little easier and giving that little extra incentive to say, hey, there's free parking if you, um, you know, have a, have a placard, you know, might, you know, help in maybe in some small way a few extra people to come to our downtown, enjoy, and spend their money. Uh, and, you know, boost up the economy. But I think, you know, when you start looking at the trade-offs, I think w the problem or the nut that I can't figure out here is I see the economic benefit, I see the human benefit. What I can't see is the operational, how we get uh, overcome the operational hurdles if we don't charge for parking because how do we get that circulation? How do we make sure that those spots are free? We can't mark tires anymore. That's against the law. <laughs> Um, we found that out <coughs> in the Supreme Court. So there's a lot of unknowables, and, and coupled with the fact that a lot of cities that, you know, have attempted to do this, um, you know, have uh, reversed it, I'm more inclined to look at a hardship application process that we could consider down the road, you know, if somebody, um, you know, with a disability needs, um, you know, free parking with a certain commitment and contract that, you know, you'll oblige by certain time commitments. But I think just unilaterally doing it does open it up for a lot of abuse and it could actually diminish the um, desired outcome that we're looking for by adding, you know, much more uh, accessible parking in the downtown. Um, I had, well, Commissioner, we haven't heard from Commissioner Douglas, and then we'll hear from Commissioner Macy and Commissioner Lester. I just want to make sure that, that people listening to or watching this know that the yellow tag that you can get is not something that you obtain because of financial need. It's something that you obtain because you are physically unable to put money in the meter is basically it. So it's tied to your physical needs, not necessarily to your financial needs. Mm -hmm. Fair clarification. Mr. Macy? Um, <clears throat> so I appreciate all the policy arguments, and there's been a lot of good information about the purpose of our parking system and the purpose of charging money not only for income for the city, but also to promote the circulation in the downtown. Uh, I'm still interested 
somewhat in this um, in having this free parking. And I, I hear that what we're saying that a lot of cities have done this and gone back. And I wondered if we might give it a trial. It seems like, um, given the fact that these spots are new, that there's been complaints that there weren't enough spots downtown and that sometimes the meters were too high. Um, you know, now at those, these spots, I think we've corrected it, but other spots is still a problem. I wonder if it would it would serve as a way of um, kind of promoting that we have these new spots downtown. You know, we did free parking in June and uh, once we had the new parking structure, I just wonder if we give it a trial because we're hearing a lot of talk about like, well, what if someone comes and sits all day? I just don't know if in all 19 of these spots that's going to be a major problem that we have. Like, I, I'm sure there will be some deceit and fraud. There are people borrowing placards and just sitting there when they're actually, you know, across the street at work. Um, but I guess we don't know what the problem is, and we're just making guesses now until we give it a try. And I wondered if it was worth giving it a try. That'd be worth a few spots trying it. Commissioner Dubuck? Oh, I'm so sorry. Commissioner sorry. Lavasser, then Commissioner Dubuck. I, I would think a lot of the... Uh, Concerns that were brought up about circulation would be concerns that you might also expect in, in the uh, parking structures and the uh, surface lots, where, which already have uh, free parking for people with uh, handicap passes. So I, I'm just wondering, number one, is whether we've noticed a circulation problem there. Uh, number two, there, there's, you know, certainly if there's communities who have had bad experience with free parking and they're reconsidering it, I certainly would want to hear that, but those materials haven't been presented to us right. for review. What we've received is something that's, I consider to be very conclusive uh, by the by the DDA saying this is our recommendation, but not a whole lot of firm reasons given to us as to, to why these are the recommendations. So I, I, I think I'm with Commissioner Macy here. I'd, I'd like to give it a try. Commissioner Dubuck? So my real concern here is that I haven't heard a reason as to why we're doing this that's in the best interest of accessibility for people with disabilities. I'm not hearing the why here. I'm not sure what problem we're solving. I understand there's some like feel-good politics going on there, but as someone that spent six years as a disability rights advocate, um, you know, accessibility isn't about making politicians feel good about themselves. It's about increasing accessibility and equity in the community. I don't see an argument that this is doing that. In fact, I see a high likelihood that it causes more problems for people who need the accessible spaces. So, so I see on one hand potential problems and, and harm to the accessibility of our downtown. And on the other hand, I, I, I don't see the argument, how, did this, how does this increase equity and accessibility in our downtown? Um, as for our service lots and our decks, those are meant for long-term parking. That's fine. They're not supposed to turn over. That's why we have them. Street parking is for the quick in and out service. It's for the easiest accessible route to the establishment. And I, honestly, this is for, for me, having spent time working on disability rights issues and accessibility, and there is nothing that we deal with that doesn't have a disability component to it. Housing and employment and education, right? Uh, workforce development, all these things have it. In all those years, I'd it was never part of our advocacy platform to say uh, no paying for parking. It was, it was not on the agenda. It was never something we were fighting for. So if there's an argument to be made, I would love to hear it, but I, I'm not seeing the policy reason to do this. What I would like, if we want to put energy into being a more accessible city, let's do that. Let's, let's be best in class for accessibility for people with disabilities. But this isn't on the to-do list if that's our goal. As far as paying for the parking spot, do does um, I'm drawing a blank on the name National Valet still have free parking for handicap people with handicap tags, no charge. I know for a while they had that. Do do you know? And I ask only because they have a number of locations in the DDA that. I, I would know they did it at one point, but I don't know if they still do. Yeah. Do you? I don't. I don't. I have no idea. Okay. I, I would like to. I'm sorry. I got one clarification. We charge for handicap in the um, structures and in most lots. The lots we don't charge are ones that had meters that, uh, according to Greg Russell, they, they couldn't really get a meter like in the back of city lot. That was a. That was a private or. Just for city vehicles, we opened up to the public. We couldn't really get meters there. But for where there's kiosks, the handi handicap uh, people still have to pay those for those spots. 
And in most of those lots and garages, there's, you know, if you have two-hour free parking, it applies to everybody, whether you yes. have a placard or not. Okay, I had uh, Commissioner Douglas and Commissioner Macy. Yeah, I feel like we're conflating disability with poverty. I mean, if, if we want to, if we're, if we're talking about offering um, people with disabilities free parking, are we doing it because they have a financial need? Now, data show that there is a slightly higher incidence of lower income among people with disabilities than not. And if we as a community want to look at all of our policies, all of the things that people pay for, um, that you know, pay the city for, from parking to taxes to dog licenses, then that's a policy discussion we might want to have. But I don't think poverty, you know, we're, we're offering a solution to address poverty here and not solving uh, the accessibility problem that Commissioner DeBuck has so clearly outlined. Um, so I, and, and I would say this, we so we as a commission asked the DDA for an opinion um, and they have considered it thoughtfully and provided an answer that says that they believe we should continue to charge the established rates for parking. Did we ask them to do that only hoping that the decision they gave us was the decision we wanted or will we respect their recommendation? Um, and I'm inclined to, in fact, I'm inclined to respect their rec recommendation and move the proposed resolution that the city commission directs staff to charge the established rates to park at all on-street on handicapped parking spaces and that all other handicapped spaces remain as currently configured. A motion by Commissioner Douglas. Is there a second? Second by Commissioner Dubuck. Commissioner Douglas, any discussion? Uh, it was my discussion. Okay. Commissioner Dubuck. Uh, I'd actually like to uh, move to amend the motion to also direct staff to ensure that payment processes at all of those pay at those accessible spaces are ADA compliant. Okay, we have a motion by Commissioner Dubuck. Is there a second? Second. Second by Commissioner Douglas. Okay, this is an amendment to the motion that's still on the table. Any discussion? Commissioner Pruch? I'm voting for the amendment at this point. Right. Call for the vote. All those in favor say aye. 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 Those opposed? Okay. Now the original motion is back on the table with the edict that <coughs> you know, staff go back and make sure that if this motion passes that any of the uh, meters or payment um, modules are compliant with the ADA that affect these uh, recently installed uh, accessible parking spots. Commissioner Macy. Uh, so I want to quickly address about, you know, we asked the DDA for a recommendation and they gave us one. Um, I agree with Commissioner Loas, there's not a lot of reasoning in here. So we just got a very detailed report from uh, Mr. Callahan that gave a lot of reasoning for everything he said, including that he didn't agree with some of the things that he was recommending, but he thought that we would want it anyway. But I didn't see a lot of things that were persuasive in this, uh, in this report for me. So we've had to do some of our own research and thankfully we have some people here who are experts and can provide some of that for us. Uh, but in terms of the policy argument that Commissioner Dubuck is looking for, I think the, the argument isn't that we are not accessible now, but perhaps the argument was that we were not terribly accessible a, a month ago. So we added this handicapped parking. We've now lowered the, the parking meters, but we've, we've been receiving complaints that, this, that we were not an accessible downtown. So yay for us for making it so, but it would be really nice if we had some way of advertising and drawing these people in and saying, look, here, here, here we're, we're going to do something to bring you back in and, and show you what we what changes we've made here in Royal Oak, and perhaps we'll see in a month's time that it's causing problems. That there's people who are just sitting in these spots um, and not not using them appropriately. But we don't know that. Uh, it's just speculation until we've given it a try. We've already discussed that there's really hardly any financial impact, um, and it does seem like there's a positive policy and people impact to drawing people in and saying. We want you here. We want you in Royal Oak. This is a place where everybody can be. Please come and enjoy. We've made some changes. Take a look. Well, I think, you know, I just a couple points on that. I think, I think it's some good points. Um, we also don't have a lot of evidence or, you know, um, material in front of us that says, um, you know, free handicap parking is the thing to do and it's best economically for the city and it's going to drive all these people here. It was a request from this commission, relatively uninformed, to say, hey, go look at it. We got back and we have some information where, you know, it was considered by people outside this committee. 
Um, we do have the fortune of having Commissioner Dubuck, who for you know um, six years served uh, as a disabilities rights advocate, and you know so you know we do have fortunately a lot of different disciplines up here. Uh, we're very fortunate. Commissioner Perush is you know stellar when it comes to environmental law, and over the years she's really helped us avoid some uh, pitfalls. Um, so, you know, I look and, and I have to look to my colleagues when, you know, certain things pop up. Commissioner Lavasser has experience in, you know, tenant landlord relations and, you know, we can rely on him for his opinion on those things. And um, so, you know, we do have, you know, somebody here that, you know, has experienced uh, this advocacy in the past. I think also, too, you could make the argument that you could run with the um, payment and see are the, are the spaces open? Are they full every day? Are they turning every day? And, you know, if so, then we've really done our job to make sure that accessibility is happening for our, um, for our visitors and that they're using it and that, you know, the, the funding or the, the financial uh, issues aren't a burden to, to put a quarter in for, for parking. So you can also look at that argument the other way. It's very hard to go back and say, oh, it's not working, and now we're going to start charging you for parking. I think that is a much tougher proposition than, you know, putting these spots in, seeing what the usage is, seeing how much they turn over and then deciding, okay, you know, let's make some of them free. Uh, I think we're doing kind of two experiments at once and maybe as a failed scientist, I'd like to have one control. Um, but, uh, you know, so you can look at it both ways. Mr. Macy. Um, so um, we did a promotion for our deck, this exact same promotion. And I don't know if we had really, really robust studies that told us that people would be more likely to come if the parking was free, but that's, I think we can all agree that's conventional wisdom, and it seems like it would probably be the case for people who are going to be parking in these spots as well. Maybe they won't be more likely to come, but if they hear this free parking, they will. And I'm suggesting we try it as a promotion. So instead of saying, we're going to give it to you, oh, wait, three months from now we're going to take it back because it didn't work, why don't we try it the same as we did this the downtown parking and say, we're, for promotion, we're going to have... But that's different than what's on the table in front of us. I didn't propose this thing on the table in front of us. No, <laughs> no but I mean, if your idea of a promotion, I, I think I, I mean, I, to get people more aware and use it, but I think that, um, one, we didn't ask the DDA to do that, and so uh, I'm not against it. I think it's a great idea. I'd be on board with that, but the motion in front of us is to, you know, from a non-promotion -pro perspective, just to make them permanently free. It sure um, is. I like the idea of maybe doing a promotion to really advertise to you know, members of our community, like, hey, check out these new spots. Come, check out, shop, dine. And I think that has a lot of value, um, and I would support that. Uh, but the motion we have in front of us is just jumping straight to a conclusion that this is the right thing to do. And I think during that promotion, we'd learn a lot of things, too. We might learn, like, hey, maybe we should continue this on a permanent basis, or maybe we don't. Uh, but I don't want to tell our, our residents, especially residents with accessibility issues, um, you know, it's free and then decide that it's causing havoc and then take it away and then we have a whole other set of issues about, you know, making our downtown work for everyone. Um, Commissioner Dubuck. Yeah, if there's a proposal that, that's about PR and promotion and raising awareness of the installation of these spots, that's different than uh, determining uh, that, there, that there's some sort of need or this is increasing accessibility. We did increase accessibility by installing the street spots. I think that they should, as a standard, be the standard rate. But if you want to do, you know, a month-long, you know, hooray, people be, should need to be aware of this and get a, you know, uh, some coverage on that so that people know about the accessible spots. Great. But the standard should be that they're that that's different than what was being discussed before, which is just making them free. A promotion, if that came in a separate motion, I would totally support that. Mr. Proosh. Um. I like Commissioner Macy's idea of a trial period because I think it solves for us um, a couple of things. First of all, it gives us information about the abuse issue. Um, I've been here long enough to been here when there was all free parking downtown on the streets. There was, and as more and more businesses came in town, not only the retail establishments but also the businesses on the second floor with the attorneys and CPAs and so on who had difficult finding parking. There was a lot of abuse. People would take up those street parkings right in front of their building and they would sit there for eight or 10 hours a day. And that's why the initial parking meters were installed and then expanded throughout the entire downtown so that there was the turnover for the businesses that needed the turnover. Mm -hmm. And that's why 
at one point, parking structures were built so that people who worked downtown would have someplace else to park during the day for the whole day without taking up street parking spaces. So I think a trial period would allow us to figure out whether or not there is going to be the types of abuse that I think we're going to find if we just have completely free parking in these spaces um, forever. Um, maybe not. Maybe we would be surprised. Um, but I, my gut feeling is because of the ease of getting a handicapped placard, um, you're going to see some abuse if we just say, well, it's free parking in these spaces forever. And I don't know that we have a solution for that. As you say, we can't mark tires anymore and determine how long a car has sat there. Um, and we really have no way to enforce, at least at, that I know of right now, you know, it's only, it's, it's free for two hours and then you have to pay, which means they would have to move the car or start putting coins in the meters or, or paying at the kiosk. Um, so I don't have a solution yet to that, how you create the turnover, but also some small amount of free parking. Um, but I think a trial period might give us some information that we don't have now about the level of abuse. The second thing that I think it would give us is we've all, the staff has done an excellent job of identifying those places where they think handicapped parking would work on the street. Um, but it could very well be that those spaces that they've identified might not be used at all, and they might be vacant all the time, and though it might be an opportunity to convert them back into paying spaces. So I think a, a trial period of maybe six months would give us information not only about the potential for abuse issue, but also help us identify the really appropriate places for the handicap spots, and we might be able to tweak that amount, maybe increase, maybe decrease, maybe move some of them. So I would be willing to give the free parking a try for a period of months. I'm thinking six months, you know, some good weather, some bad weather, and just see how it goes, and then reevaluate at the end of the six-month period and decide whether or not we want to make it permanent or whether we want to tweak it or whether there's some other way we can manage the program um, so that it, it works a little bit better. I also think that Commissioner Macy is correct that having it free initially is a, is a, is a great promotional tool to use. Um, uh, it, 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 it just it, it sends the message that we are not only a welcoming community and have been over the years, but now we're even more welcoming to different populations that we may not have served as well in the past. So, um, so I think it serves that purpose as well. So I'm not going to vote for the motion that is on the table, but I think we can, because it doesn't involve the six-month trial period. But it accepts the recommendation of the um, so if you vote against it then free parking would go in permanently if you vote for it then it accepts the recommendation but then we could immediately do a free so we're in one of these double negative quandaries depending on what I hear you say okay what I was thinking was proposing a motion after this motion that we would have a six month trial period and then revisit and then revisit right yes we did no, and then revisit. Yeah, promotional period for six months, marketing that they're free and, and see what the data looks like and what issues that we have, the business owner complaints, uh, other handicapped people, hey, I can't get a spot, they're all taken up. Yes. Uh, complaints, that sort of thing. Yes. So the way I read the motion right now is that the motion is to accept the downtown development authority's rec recommendation to not offer free parking so if you vote in favor of the if you vote in favor of this then you know immediately after we've accepted it but then we can always do another motion to offer a promotional period for six months or whatever the time everything that Commissioner Macy's idea if you vote no on this and the and it fails um, then does that put us in a um, position to um, Actually, there's two resolutions here. So actually, there is no, they'd have to put a resolution on the, the table, the commission would, to accept the free, right? So if we reject this one, there's still no decision on. Well, right now, all the spots are metered. Right. So all of them right now are, I'm so if we reject, If we reject the DDA's recommendation, that doesn't result in an automatic free handicap spot, right? That's my understanding is... Another motion would have to be made to offer it for free. Free parking. Okay, so we can reject it then. I was I misspoke earlier, Commissioner Perush. 
Okay, thank you for that clarification. I mean, the truth is we don't even really need a motion at all. I mean, the, the motion is to keep doing what we're doing. Yes. Right. You're right. Right. You're right. So we could vote for the motion and keep doing what we're doing. Yeah, actually, if you vote for the motion, there's no change in what we would be doing. We're still charging for them. Hmm. But if you vote against it, well, this is unusual. If you vote against it, we still will continue to do what we're doing. Yeah. So there's actually zero merit to this motion on the table right now right. if I take the premise to be true and draw that conclusion. So withdraw the motion. So I'll leave it up to the commission since I can't do anything about this. It's all your motions. Other well, than call for a vote. All right. Any other discussion? Um... All right, let's just see what happens because it's irrelevant. <laughs> should we, we should, there should be some Robert's rule about how we shouldn't do this. Like, we shouldn't be voting on, right? Well, the resolution to accept the resolution. recommendation is what was presented. Yeah. All right. So, all right, I'll call for the vote. All those in favor say aye. Aye. Those opposed? No. Nay. Nays? Okay, so guess what, guys? We're in exactly the same position <laughs> that we were 10 minutes ago. So, um, Commissioner Perouche makes this excellent. Commissioner Perouche. I will make a motion that we offer free parking in the new handicapped on street spaces for a trial period of six months and that the staff, as best they can, evaluate um, turnover and um, uh, usability, use. Uh, how much each space is used, um, and give us a report back at the end of the six months or close to the end of the six months, uh, and then we'll go from there. Okay, and is that more of like a promotional period when you say like promote it, like free parking? Yeah, I should add that aspect that to, to the extent that we can, we promote the idea that the handicapped street spaces uh, are free for a six-month period. Okay. And we have a second by Commissioner Macy. Sorry, she had the shoes already oh, ready. Yeah. All right. Discussion. Mr. Douglas. So that assumes that after the six month period, prices go back to the current rates unless we take further action. We'll, we'll have a report to so the prompt, yeah. yes. Yeah. Yes. Could I just, from an enforcement standpoint, if we're going to um, promote this, you may want to include the surface lots just so it's, it's clear, so there's no misunderstanding of what's. Mm. what we're expected to pay and what you're not. The structures would be very difficult to allow free parking because of the ticket system, but um, if we're going to promote free parking, we wouldn't want someone coming in, parking in a metered spot where they're not really clear on what's free and what's not it, uh, from the from the surface. <coughs> That's a good point. Yeah. I'll, I'll move to amend the... Uh, the motion to include the uh, service parking lots. A motion by Commissioner Vassar, second by Commissioner Perouche. Discussion mm -hmm. on that amendment? With none, I'll call for the vote. All those in favor say aye. 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 Those opposed? No. Okay. We have a uh, amendment to the motion. Okay. All right. Now the motion on the table right now is to offer a promotional period of six months. Test, get a report back. Um, it's going to include the newly added um, handicap spots as well as the surface level spots. And, um, you know, we'll decide as a commission six months from now what the next course of action is from a permanent perspective. Discussion? Commissioner Dubuck? Yeah, I, you know, I oppose the motion just for all the reasons I stated. I don't think this is actual policy designed to help people with disabilities to improve accessibility of our city when there actually are things we could do that would do that. I think this is uh, feel-good politics, people wanting to check off a campaign bullet point and have something nice to point to that doesn't actually accomplish anything for anybody. Well, I agree with Commissioner Dubuck. I do like the idea of promoting, um, you know, accessible parking for six months. I, I don't know that on a permanent basis this is something that we'll grant, but I think when you have a new uh, way of doing something, like a new parking garage, you often offer free parking, and when you have new accessible parking in your town, letting people know they have disabilities, that there's better parking and encouraging them to come here and spend their money and do whatever, um, that'll be my basis for supporting this. Uh, but in the long run, you know, I, I think 
you know, I, I have to understand, and I, I don't see it here tonight exactly the, you know, the benefit. In, in fact, in the long run, I think we're going to find through this that uh, in the six months that, you know, we'll have long-term parkers there and uh, we'll actually reduce accessibility. But um, promoting it and offering it for a six-month period is free to attract people with um, all ability types to spend their money and come and visit Royal Oak, I think is appropriate in this case. Commissioner Macy. Um, I just realized that we lost Commissioner Dubuck's amendment because that motion didn't pass. So I, he, mean? he amended that we would direct staff to <coughs> examine the accessibility of all of the pay, pay methods for the park. That amendment's still on. No, because we voted down the motion. Oh, that's right. I see what you're saying. Yeah. Okay. So I don't know if he wants to remake that motion. Uh, I'll make it as a separate motion after this motion. Okie dokie. Okay. All righty. Any other discussion? All right. I'll call for the vote. All those in favor say aye. 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 Those opposed? No. no. Okay. Commissioner Dubuck? Uh, I'll move uh, to direct staff to ensure that all payment procedures and uh, uh, infrastructure are ADA compliant. Motion by Commissioner Dubuck, second by Commissioner Pruch. Discussion? With none, I'll call for the vote. All those in favor say aye. 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 Those opposed? Motion passes. All righty. Any more motions on this topic? <coughs> All right. So we will have newly installed uh, street side handicap accessible parking in our community, and we will be offering a promotional six-month period uh, of free parking. So um, come in and enjoy our downtown. All righty. This brings us to item number 12, discussion of marijuana establishments and medical marijuana facilities. Mr. Gillum. Mayor and City Commissioners, uh, we had had a work session uh, back on July 22nd. Um, subsequent to that work session, I was going to provide the commission with some additional information, which I have in a couple of uh, emails offline. In addition to that, um, the planning department staff finalized their preparation of materials for the uh, for consideration by the planning commission at tomorrow night's meeting. Those materials are posted on the uh, um, on the agenda for tonight's meeting. Included in those materials are the maps that we had talked about at the work session regarding the, the buffer zones or setbacks, if you will, in the various zoning districts within the city. Um, if you have any specific questions about the information that I had provided to you, I can try to answer those questions for you. Uh, Mr. Twing is here if you have questions about the materials that uh, have been provided for the Planning Commission. <coughs> questions for Mr. Twing. I'll go with uh, Commissioner Douglas first. So I, I, I think I asked this question last time we, when we had a work session on this subject, and I'm, I'm going to ask it again. Does, so what we have proposed right now is allowing both uh, medical, uh, I'll, I'll use common phrasing here, medical marijuana and recreational marijuana. Are there, does adding medical uh, expand or guarantee the rights of people who need it for medical purposes and or does it create an additional burden on our staff and, and my goal here is to make sure that people who need it now for medical purposes can easily obtain it and it does seem to me that if we allow recreational use in the city then we don't really need medical marijuana because anybody can come and buy it and if you have a caregiver I mean if you can't uh, can't walk and you need to send your caregiver to get it you know they can go in and, and buy it for you so that's my that's my first question well there are differences between the medical marijuana statute and the MRTMA statute and I provided you with the chart that uh, has been prepared by the Michigan Municipal League which identifies the differences between the two acts so, but my question remains, does the net effect of that uh, exp expand opportunities for people sufficiently, or is it easier just to adopt a recreational ordinance knowing that people with medical needs will fully benefit? Well, I don't know if you're directing that question to me. I think that's a judgment call that the city commission has to make. Well, so then 
if you've got two sets of regulations, if you've got medical and recreational, does that add additional time or work to the law department or the planning department? Does it simplify things for city operations to only go with recreational? I, I would speak for community development. Um, I think it's simpler to allow both. Um, I think from my read of how the state's going to treat their licensing, you'll see in some of the materials, they're, they're treating them as equivalent, depending on whether you have a provisioning center or that they've established that certain things are the same. From the community development planning standpoint and land use standpoint, um, whether it's a facility under medical or an establishment under recreational, we're going to treat them the same. They're both selling uh, marijuana products. The licensing part of it, if the city commission uh, got into licensing, might, might treat them differently. But in terms of the setback or buffer zones, depending on how you wanted to refer to them, uh, we're not going to treat them differently. Um, so I don't see the, the benefit of limiting it to one or the other. <coughs> um, frankly, I think it would take more staff time to explain to an applicant why they can't come when the other one could. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I, I would, to answer your question, I'd recommend if you're going to allow any, you would allow both types. Okay, that's uh, thanks. I, that that answers that question. Um, another question: Can we at the planning commission limit the number of uh, applications at a given meeting? And, and here's why I ask this question. I mean, if we allow some form of you know either form of um, uh, facilities or establishments we're going to at some point have a flood of applicants looking for special land uses. Well, actually, they'll come, because the city commission approves special land uses. My, my question is, is there a way to manage the number of applications at a planning commission meeting? Well, the planning commission bylaws already say you're limited to eight public hearings at a meeting. Okay. Uh, if you wanted to change your bylaws, you could change that and limit it to fewer, I would think, in terms of how many you want to process okay. at any one time. Uh, but your your bylaws do already say that at the Planning Commission. Now, that's not the City Commission. Oh. And this, the way we've drafted the ordinance that the Planning Commission is going to talk about tomorrow night is that it, it would be, a spe depending on what they're going to allow and where, they would, they would be a special land use require the public hearing, but rather than the Planning Commission deciding and approving, those are going to float up to the City Commission for a final action on it, uh, probably in concert with any licensing provisions you may get into. That's one of the very few special land uses that do come to the City Commission. Uh, the other things that you've seen is PUD is technically rezoning. And, and you see those, but that's not how the draft language would, would go. Most special land uses stop at the Planning Commission. Only um, the residential accessory parking lots are another one that float up to the City Commission. Uh, so. Thank you. That's, sure. that's it for me. Any other questions for Mr. Twain? Just procedurally for everyone's involvement in this, the, the Planning Commission is going to talk about it in detail tomorrow in terms of uh, the zoning ordinance tax amendments and what I've provided to Dave and that you're attached is the materials that we gave to them for consideration tomorrow. Uh, we'll go through that. It is not a public hearing tomorrow. It hasn't been noticed. It's just an opportunity for staff to explain to the Planning Commission their options, their considerations. Uh, and have them either ask staff for additional information or potentially to set it for a public hearing at a future meeting, having given us some direction on what they think we should set for a public hearing. The materials that you have provide them with options. We would simply ask them tomorrow to narrow that option down. What do they want us to, uh, uh, to consider in part of that? So there's a 
there's options in the materials. Uh, when we do the public hearing, we'd have to be a little more definitive in what we're putting out for notice and considering. Um, but I, that's not a public hearing tomorrow. It's the Planning Commission's real first opportunity to dive into uh, this discussion. So once they're done with that, we'll hold the public hearing. If the Planning Commission uh, is comfortable after the public hearing and providing a recommendation to the City Commission, then that tax amendment will come to you. I would suspect that they won't take any action at the meeting of the public hearing. I would suspect they'd hold it over for another meeting to contemplate it and then, then finalize their recommendation and send it up to you for consideration. So I wouldn't expect you to see a planning commission recommendation prior to late October, early November at the earliest. Commissioner Macy and then Commissioner So Bursch. just that, that was sort of going to be my question is what happens next and what do you need from us tonight? Nothing or just I don't need anything from you tonight. Okay. It was my understanding the commission had this topic back on the agenda to have more conversation on it. So what I did was simply gave uh, okay. uh, Dave and, the, and uh, Corey a copy of what, what's going to be discussed tomorrow night. Um, so I don't, okay. I don't need anything along from you and This tonight. is just for our discussion. No. Commissioner Bruce. Um, back to Commissioner um, Douglas's point about a flood of applications, we had talked at one point about having a requirement that when an applicant applies for a city license that they have their state license approval in hand first before we would consider their license application here as a way of winnowing out um, the speculative, the fly-by-night type people who really haven't gotten their act together because the state licensing requirements are so stringent. Is that also the case with application for a special land use? Is that? Well, the way we were going to approach it is the state has a pre-qualification portion of, of their application process. Mm -hmm. That pre-qualification would say that they're looking at it uh, and it would allow the applicant to then come to the city to try and find a location. I don't think we're going to be able to wait until they've actually, you, you can't get a state license unless you have a local right. approval of a location. Okay. So it's going to be, yes, we're going to probably require them to be pre-qualified at the state along with some other things before we'll process a special land use. If you also enact a licensing ordinance, I would think that they'd also have to submit that material to the appropriate department, whether it's the police department, and so that that's going on in concert with uh, the land use decision. Okay, so so we could we could at least whether it's it's in the ordinance or whether we just establish it by rules. Um, put in the requirement that they have to be pre-qualified by the state before we'll consider a special land use. But since they need a special land use approval before they can get final state licensing, we can't require them to get the license first. Okay. But I'm wondering if, it, if it's not appropriate, and the plan commission could consider this, to actually explicitly say in the ordinance, you know, we're not going to consider a special land use application until we see the pre-qualification stuff mm -hmm. approval from the right. state. Right. That. Yeah. With only eight public hearings that we can have at planning, we don't want to have, you know, just anybody be able to fill out an application like a gold rush and, you know, tie up hearing time. Because I imagine those hearings aren't just for <laughs> these establishments, but they'd be for anything, right? New developments, whatever. So I think we have to have some criteria to make sure we have serious candidates that are applying to the Planning Commission. And I think that pre-qualification gets us a little bit closer there. Mm -hmm. Well, if you, turn, if, if, if you turn to the part of the text amendment, attachment one, that says Article 5 at the top, it's page 12 of 14. If you skim down to paragraph uh, B1, it, it starts talking about application requirements, and the first one is 
the petitioner has pre-qualification status as a licensed applicant with the state of Michigan. Oh, there it is. Yeah. Yes, I didn't see that. It's right already there. And that's in the majority of cities that have. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Good. Questions for Mr. Twin? Commissioner Macy? Well, just so I, I guess the whole point is that all of this licensing stuff, the discussion we're having, we heard some commentary today on, on licensing and how we're going to make those decisions. That's not part of what we're talking about with what you no, provided, the, the right? This is the all licensing zoning. ordinance will be totally separate. <coughs> okay. This is simply the zoning uh, land use discussion. Uh, your licensing ordinance may have a lot more operational type things in it. This is just the land use portion of where we're where you're potentially going to allow a facility what district and any special provisions in regards to parking setbacks building configurations things like that okay so yeah, I, but I'm sorry but having said that this is an appropriate time if you want to have discussion about what you'd like to have in a licensing ordinance oh, okay so because the more input I get the easier it's going to be for us to prepare a licensing ordinance okay okay so one more question for mr. Twing so it looked to me like I, I guess I you sort of just gave the list of the things that you're going to be looking at when you when the Planning Commission looks at this because my understanding when I read this is um, you, you're basically filling in the blanks for how big we want those setbacks to be from the from the schools and religious institutions um, so that's what's going to be percolating through but no, you're not deciding about number of licenses or you're not making recommendations on that or you are I'm not in the zoning ordinance making any recommendation about the number. I would okay. believe that would occur as part of your licensing. All right, good. I think depending on what distance and setbacks you accommodate, um, you're going to limit geographically yeah, right. the availability. You'll see in the report we tried to make some <laughs> guesstimation of if you had a 1,000-foot setback from schools and a 1,000-foot separation between facilities, you might get 10. I mean, we, we, we tried to do some of that. We tried right. to identify properties. Now, from a licensing standpoint, I believe you can distinguish between how many of each type you wanted to get. But again, to the point I yeah. tried to make during the hearing before was, under the State Act, if you limit the number of licenses specifically by number and the number of applications exceed the number of applications that you the number of licenses that you've indicated you're going to issue then you have to establish the process to determine which of the applicants are actually going to get city licenses which is a legal minefield as far as I'm concerned right so I think what we'll need to do is to work in concert because depending upon how buffer zones and setback requirements and things like that are developed in the zoning ordinance, those may effectively put a limit on the number of licenses without us having to draw an arbitrary number as right. to the number of licenses. Yeah. Since we're talking about licenses as well, um, you know, some of the feedback that I took back from our um, survey that we did, the Cobalt survey, um, was you know, people seem to feel comfortable, at least out of the gate, treating this similarly to how we manage alcohol establishments, either retail or, you know, serving. Um, can you elaborate a little bit more, Mr. Gillum, about how we would look at potential plans of operation? And is that an option in this? And, you know, could we do it similarly that we do today, where we could evaluate each plan of an applicant so they go through the planning, they get everything approved, they come here, and we can say, you know, okay, this plan looks appropriate, um, and maybe give your two cents on that. Is that a good thing, a bad thing? Does it open up a legal um, uh, landmine issue, as you explained, with the uh, limits? Talk us through that a bit. Well, the potential concern I would have is if you talk about a plan of operation and, and, and the, the, the benefits that that particular plan may or may not provide to the community, you're talking about subjective criteria because what you feel may, may be an appropriate or effective plan of operation may not be the same plan that Commissioner Gibbs mm -hmm. thinks. So um, the, the more we can deal with specifics, the biggest being the pre-qualification at the state level in terms of eligibility for a city license, the better. 
as far as I'm concerned. Can we make a residential requirement? Uh, we had some conversation at um, you know public comment tonight about you know local people being you know versus big corporations. Is that even possible? Um, in the licensing requirement to say that you have to have a resident owner. Or is that uh, I mean you might be able to establish some kind of a preference okay. but I don't think you could require it okay so mr. Gibbs Grand Rapids and I can't recall all the details of it but um had a requirement <coughs> for uh, recommendation maybe is a better term um, for one of the owners of the establishment to be a resident of Grand Rapids or one of the owners or the operators of whatever type of establishment it, you know, whether it's a provisional center or a growth center or whatever it is, um, be a resident of the city. I don't know how that panned out, um, but I know at one time they did have that requirement, so it, it might be something worth looking, looking at. Into, sure. And there very well could be other cities that have that same requirement. Grand Rapids is the one that sticks out in my memory. Can we, and I don't know if this comes as part of planning or if it comes as part of licensing, but before your application, you have to prove or show that you have an interest or a potential you know, interest in a, a approved property, not approved property, but an eligible property. So for example, you know, a person would have to come in and apply and say, okay, I have a potential lease deal on this particular property contingent upon city approvals. Mm -hmm. Therefore, my application is you, you, know, you, you, you have to have a property interest in order for the planning office to take an application under everything. Right. But you, I'm talking, but does the planning come before the licensing or the licensing come before the planning and can you require it in the I, licensing? I would recommend they, they end up uh, on, a, on a parallel path and end up here on the same night and you approve both on the same evening. Yeah, I'd agree with Mr. Twing. You, you'd want to require it in both. Okay. So whether it's an actual property interest ownership or a lease or an option, something like that, yeah. And, I, and, and as I understand the pre-qualification process at the state, the idea is that the first step is to make sure that the individuals that would be involved in the, in the business meet all the state criteria. And then the, once they, the individuals have met the qualification criteria at the state level, then, as, as Tim indicated, then they can come to the community and nail down where it is that they actually want to do business and then get the local issues worked out before they go back to the before state. Before they go back to the state. And then it would still be dependent. If the state turned them down, then it's like, okay, well, everything he did is. But it helps us from having to go through a 1,000 applications to get to 3 or 4 or 10 or whatever that actually will come to fruition. Yes. Okay, and planning, I mean, you, again, you say both at the same time, but I guess they would have to come before planning first. They'd have to show a land interest, and then it would come to the city commission for final approval, and you're saying at the same time have the licensing provision. Yeah, the what I would envision, and again, we're, 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 we're at the beginning of it and talking with the planning commission and you, is the, the submission for the planning division to accept an application from somebody would include two elements in my mind, a bunch of others in terms of submission requirements, but they'd have to be pre-qualified with the state and they'd have to have applied uh, to the city, to whatever department, whether it's Mr. Gillum or, or the police department, for their license at the local level and submitted those materials. Because if, from a planning standpoint, I see no point in processing somebody that hasn't got those things already together. So yes, you're right, it would have, then the planning commission action would have to occur as far as a recommendation, but the police department or the city attorney would then deal with the licensing. But both processes would end here on the same evening. Right. Right. 
Um, and just one more question on the licensing. Um, I know with, uh, I mean, we've had experience in the past with, you know, the bistro licenses and things like that, how we kept it with the property or that owner, and they'd have to, and, you know, transfer of the license or, you know. Um, I know from a zoning perspective, there are some, I mean, obviously there are things that go with the property, but from a licensing perspective, um, what options do we have to ensure that we don't have sort of a flipping, you know, uh, sale um, situation going on? <clears throat> yeah, I think you can definitely put some limits on transferability of a license. Mm -hmm. So, and I think that's something we, we would want to do. Okay. So. Commissioner Macy and then Commissioner Douglas. Um, I just want to follow up real quick, Mr. Twing. So, so for it to get in front of planning, you, they only have to have a, applied for a license, like the, from through the city, whatever the appropriate department ends up being, rather than having even some kind of preliminary approval. Because that's, I mean, I guess I don't, I don't understand it. None of us do yet. But um, it seems like there could be then the flood that we're talking about coming in front of planning commission that you have to consider all of these when we know we're going to have a limited number of licenses and not all the ones who apply could possibly get it. So I just wonder if it. it no, the, the two that I referenced was pre-qualification at the state. Yeah. And then having at least submitted the application and materials for whatever local, local licensing you need um, in order to actually then submit to the planning office, you'd need those two. So then I at least know that they've taken care of those items. Both, both approvals are going to end up, if you adopted the ordinance the way it's drafted, both approvals would end up in front of the city commission, you would right, grant right. them both, and I and I would recommend to you that you grant the, the layout, the building configuration, the zoning planning issues at the same time you're dealing with the operational issues. You can huh. tie them together and and they see that they work together, and and maybe the planning commission action sets for three months while they're waiting for processing of the. Uh, of the license. Uh, license part. Or vice um, versa. I mean. Okay. Yes, we, we did have a, a, someone speak at public comment tonight who raised a couple of ideas that I think we should consider as we look at a licensing agreement. And the mayor touched on it just a moment ago, the idea of some sort of moratorium on transfers of approved licenses, some set period, one or two years. Um, the idea that uh, an owner can't sublease their property either, and that would, I guess, constitute a transfer. Um, and um, the idea that uh, they have, and, and these, th that they have standards about uh, the condition of the property in terms of, um, you know, litter, litter, landscaping, you know, crime prevention, that there be physical conditions that maybe we don't find in our existing um, code enforcement ordinance um, that we want to apply to these establishments. We call it a good neighbor plan. Yeah. Good neighbor plan. Which is fine and good, but I think we would have to be specific as to what the requirements would have to be. So. Hmm. Mr. Macy? That leads me to the speaking of being specific. To one other thing that I was thinking um, to discuss this further on the licensing end. So someone today was saying, you know, we, we should have a very strict merit-based system, and someone else was saying about we should make sure we have some local involvement in this, and then we have this good neighbor plan idea. Uh, I think it might be helpful for someone to come up with a list of things that other other communities have done in terms of when they're looking at licensing so give us like a laundry list here are all the things that you can possibly consider because I'm not even sure what that universe is um, for the next time that we're going to be meeting to discuss this to get an idea of what which ones we maybe like and don't and, and I'm <clears throat> I'm fine doing that or, or having my staff do it something like that but keep in mind what we'll be compiling a list of things that other people some have already have an ordinance that's in place. A lot of places are like us. They're going through the process of developing ordinance, but we really don't have any definitive answers from the courts yet as to what ultimately we can do and we cannot do. This is all too new, but we'll do the best we can. And we'll leave that to you at the end. <laughs> any other discussion? Input on licensing? Input on zoning before it goes to the Planning Commission tomorrow. 
Okay, I guess Shar and I will take it from here tomorrow. Planning Commission, 7.30. Seven. 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 Oh. I'm always early, so I like to tell myself. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> Okay, thank you, Mr. Twain. All right, that brings us to our last agenda item, which is item number 13, approval of interim city manager employment agreement. Um, Mr. O'Donoghue. I think the mayor pro tem is going to take this one. Uh, thank you, Mr. O'Donoghue. Uh, after our last commission meeting, the City Manager Search Subcommittee, which consists of Commissioners Gibbs, Macy, and myself met. Um, and we had received an offer from our city attorney to serve as the interim city manager. Uh, the terms are that uh, he would be compensated an additional $1,500 a month for a specified six months, that is with, with no consideration to cut it short, um, it would be for that period of time. Um, and there would be no other benefits to him, no changes. He is currently a, a contract employee, so this would just be an amendment to his contract. We understood at the time that having him serve as our interim city manager will create a void in the law department. Uh, right now, we have one staffer who's been on on and off more off than on or more on than off medical leave. Um, we have vacations coming up. We could not talk him into requiring one of his employees to cancel his vacation. <laughs> I did try. I I know. Um, and uh, so. Uh, in terms of prosecutions and the district court, the proposal that Mr. Gillum has suggested is that he will draw from the pool of attorneys that we are now using for indigent, indigent defense. They typically work at $100 an hour. He, of course, will choose people who are not already um, actively involved in defenses that we're prosecuting, uh, but he feels there's a sufficient pool of talent at that price point to be able to cover work in the court. And he's going to jump right in and correct me anytime I make a mistake here. You're doing fine. Um, certainly, Mr. Gillum will continue to serve the city commission. Um, he will continue to supervise thing, our, our outside attorneys, especially in, for example, insurance cases. Um, but there are going to be other tasks that need to be done by a someone qualified in municipal law that he's going to have to delegate. Um, we, he estimated that the going rate for someone with that level of knowledge and skill is going to be between $150 and $200 an hour. Um, I did a little sort of back of the envelope calculation figuring, I mean, let us say that Mr. Gillum is, is able to spend half his time working as the interim city manager and doing some law things, uh, but needs someone else half time to fill in for him um, over a six month period that could amount to $126,000. Now I think we have faith in Mr. Gillum to use his own judgment to choose those substitutes wisely and economically um, but we are uh, trusting him with those decisions and the committee is a hundred percent confident that we can trust him to make those decisions in the best interest of the city of Royal Oak. Uh, and so I would uh, make a uh, submit a resolution that the city commission authorizes the mayor and city clerk to sign the addendum to Mr. Gillum's employment agreement to provide service as interim city manager. Motion by Commissioner Douglas. We have a second by Commissioner Macy. Further discussion? Commissioner Macy? I'll just repeat what I said at the subcommittee that I... Um, I'm so grateful to Mr. Gillum for stepping up into this role that uh, this is a really big job and um, I think uh, Mr. O'Donohue was ready <laughs> ready to get out of it. Um, and this was a, a tricky issue. We needed someone to do this and we needed someone we could, who we felt like could trust, we could step into it um, quickly and competently and someone that we trust and to have him here and willing to do that was a great relief. And um, so I'm grateful to him for stepping in and for providing this plan to fill the void in his absence um, so that we can continue running the city and doing good things. Anything else? I'll just say that I've had the privilege of 
working with Mr. Gillum for the better part of eight years now. A little time off. We're glad to have him back. I think he's a, a true asset, a, a great legal mind, calm and patient <coughs> always, and I think he'll um, be a good uh, uh, interim city manager uh, as we move forward in a permanent search. Um, I'm glad that part of this agreement um, does provide for um, the ability to um, hire the appropriate legal staff and expertise that we need to keep that department running uh, during this process. We've explained the entire time that you can't do two full-time jobs <laughs> adequately. So while um, I'm appreciative of Mr. Gillum stepping up and um, you know taking on the extra burdens, we have a little bit of relief for him, although I want it to be clear to everybody that it's still additional work. He's not totally disbanding all of his previous activities, and you know we have to be reasonable. With all the things that we have going on, we can't put you know, a tremendous amount of pressure on staff. Uh, and uh, But if somebody can do it, I know Mr. Gillum can do it. I'm confident Chief O'Donohue could do it too. Well, it's not a knock against you, sir. Um, but uh, I think this puts us in a good position. But So the taxpayers and everyone know, you know, it's not $1,500 versus $14,000 or 18000 I mean, we are going to have to spend money appropriately so uh, on the legal department. So I don't want there to be any surprises in, in those amounts you know, um, uh, we'll get our money's worth because Mr. Gillum will be overseeing it. But, you know, this isn't a, a big savings. This is about getting the right person in the right job at the right time to make sure that we don't have six months of downtime here. So, Commissioner Macy. I just wanted to add, I think I wanted to correct one thing Commissioner Douglas said earlier about how this is a six-month set contract. So that's true for the total payment. However, Mr. Gillum has said that if another, if we hire a city manager in four months, he will step down, but we'll expect to be paid for the entire six that we are contra contracting him for. Right. And he also said that if it took, takes us seven months, he will continue into that seventh month on a monthly basis, right. month to month basis. Thank that's you. the commission wants. That's correct, yeah. Okay. All right. Well, I'm going to call for the vote. All those in favor say aye. 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 Those opposed? The motion passes. Switch seats. Back to the media I like this seat just fine. Thank you. <laughs> Too late to back out now, Dave. <laughs> All right. Um, well, notwithstanding anything to improve the quality of life for our neighbors and friends here in the city of Royal Oak, I'll entertain a motion to adjourn. Moved. A motion by Commissioner Gibbs, second by P Commissioner Perouche. Discussion on this important motion. Commissioner Lavasser. <laughs> I think I'm inclined to support this motion. <laughs> <laughs> tell us why, tell us why. But, but before I do, I do want to make sure we, we I do have some photos here that were presented to us during uh, public comment. They involved the development over at the Chin Jeweler location. I want to make sure our city clerk gets those. Very good. All right, any other um, robust discussion on this important motion? <laughs> All right, with none, I'll call for the vote. All those in favor say aye. 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 Those opposed, motion passes. Adjourned.